Arc of Direction, an Astrological Tale, by Junius B. Smith, from Weird Tales, June 1925. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. He scoffed at the signs in his horoscope. An Arc of Direction by Junius B. Smith The young man cast the stub of his cigarette from the open window and laughed. Your theories are absurd, my dear Elton. If a man could always tell when to sow and when to reap, his fortune would be assured. Exactly, Elton agreed, fingering the pages of the book on astrology, which he evidently had been perusing when the other came in. After a moment he continued, Naturally, you don't believe one may look into the future. If you want my candid opinion, I do not. I may say I will have a coffee for breakfast, but I'm not certain of it. I may be dead when breakfast time comes. He rolled another cigarette and set it alight. I may not even finish the smoke in my mouth, he added as he tossed the still-blazing match out the window. Elton viewed the act with a little frown upon his face. I'm afraid, friend Hall, that to you fate will be fate indeed, for you act without due thinking. For instance, how do you know where that cigarette stub went, or the match which followed it? For all you know, it may have struck tinder, and I may be seeking accommodations tonight. Tut, tut, there's nothing outside but some vines running up the wall, as they do over at my place, and some flowers and grass on the other side of the cement walk. I saw all that the last time you showed me your horticultural skills. You assume there has been no change. You do not really know. The one who trusts in chance has his destiny fixed by the stars. Just when and where were you born? Hall took the cigarette from his lips as Elton reached for a sheet of paper on which to make the notation. You're not really serious, old dear. Surely you don't take any stock in that exploded thing. Let us talk about something worthwhile. We are doing just that. I am curious as to the date of your demise. Hall shrugged his shoulders. Poppycock! If I didn't know you as a successful businessman, I'd think something was wrong with your head. I don't know, but there is anyway. A doctor once told me that everybody was crazy on at least one subject. Nobody ever told me what subject I'm bugs on, and I suppose no one knows his pet failing, nor believes anyone who tells him. So you think you can tell when I'm going to die? That's rich. I don't know myself. You will if you give me the information I asked. By cracky, I believe you believe you can tell. I'll bet you a quart of pink lemonade against that one lunged fliver of yours that I outwear your dilapidated tires. Maybe so, maybe so. I can't tell when you're going to die if you don't tell me where and when you were born. In the end, Hall gave the information asked. "'And now what?' asked the younger man. "'Shall I wait until you diagnose my case, or shall I return at some later date?' "'Just as you like,' Elton replied. "'It involves considerable work, so perhaps you'd better call around in a week from now.' It was a month before Hall again visited his friend. When he did, it was with no intention of learning his fate as foretold by the stars, but rather upon another matter. Nor was the subject brought up by him, though what he said directly opened the question. I'm going to be married in September. Elton considered the statement for a moment, but said nothing. Sweetest girl you ever saw, Hall amplified. Still no comment. You're to stand up with me, if you will. It was that that brought me here today. I'm glad you came, Elton at last broke his silence. I was about to set forth and find you. 
your announcement does not come as a surprise to me for such an attachment is shown in your horoscope for this time but and he weighed his words carefully if you really want the girl you had better marry her immediately of course she might object to being left a widow so soon shall i call a doctor for you elton you talk as if you're sick i'm not sick and i don't need a doctor but in all seriousness friend hall you need a nurse or at least a bodyguard in the very near future for according to my calculations on the tenth of next month unless you do something to prevent it you will most assuredly be hanged hall looked at elton for a full minute then spoke you surely don't believe that bunk if you are joshing i think you have gone far enough i was never more serious in my life according to my calculated arcs of direction arcs of what hall involuntarily exclaimed arcs of direction planetary angulations we astrologers calculate to tell when the designated result will materialize oh i see first you tell what is going to happen to a fellow and then when so i'm going to be hanged on the tenth of next month quick work i haven't killed anybody yet and they don't hang them that soon even if i should go out and kill somebody between now and then oh there are lots of ways in which you might get hanged some over enthusiastic citizens for instance might string you up to the nearest telegraph pole or convenient limb you wouldn't be the first man who had suffered a vicarious death quit it elton you're making my nerves jumpy he moved toward the window and looked out i'll miss you greatly elton replied let me tell the girl all about it maybe she'll marry you at once to take care of you get a bodyguard or do something believe me a fool if you like but don't take a chance fate has an unkind way of pulling mean little tricks you gloomy old cuss you're scaring me out of a year's growth you look as if you were attending my funeral already the tenth of the following month came and hall had taken no precautionary measures every time he thought of what elton told him he felt sorry for elton his mind was undoubtedly slipping pity too genius and insanity are very close together he lay in a bed and looked up at the ceiling and pondered about what his friend had told him this was the day he was to be hanged he never felt any further from death than he did that very minute of course he might walk out on the street and something unforeseen befall him all in all perhaps it were better to remain in his home all day in bed even only that seemed plumb foolish on second thought he would remain indoors there was no use taking chances as elton had pointed out there was nothing he had to do so he might as well do it at home as elsewhere of course elton had wanted him to provide a bodyguard some sort of companion who would cut him down perhaps but that was beside the question what need did he have for a bodyguard the bodyguard might hang him his mind began all sorts of queer gymnastics he was nervous in spite of himself he crawled out of bed when the sun shining through the open window drove him to it after a shower he slowly dressed suddenly an idea hit him elton so cocksure i'm gonna die today i believe i'll phone him and tell him to come over that's killing two birds with one stone he'd make an excellent bodyguard that is if he isn't crazy and we can play chess which will while the hours away yep i'll get him on the phone immediately and he did was just coming over anyway elton told him hall made some toast and poached an egg his appetite wasn't very keen living alone in a two-story house and doing his own cooking when not eating in a cafeteria was getting monotonous to say the least he was glad he was to be married in september it would be different when he had a wife to take charge of the home 
which had been left him by his parents. His frugal meal finished, he ran upstairs to get his chessboard and men. The sunlight was pouring through the window in added volume. It was too beautiful a day to be cooped up. But he'd forget all about that when he and Elton got to playing chess. He decided he might as well make his bed while waiting for Elton and busied himself in that occupation. Then he went to the open window and looked out. Elton should be coming any minute now. Speeding autos flashed to and fro. The honk of an occasional horn sounded warning. An old horse pulling a still older express wagon rattled past. The driver hunched on his seat. A bicycle or two added variety, and men, women, and children sauntered, hurried, or ran along the walks, according to what each was intent upon doing. Hall wondered if any of those down upon whom he was looking would turn aside long enough to hang him. His face lighted with a rather amused smile. He'd have to talk to the doctor about Elton. It wasn't good for a man to get such crazy notions into his head. His eyes drifted to his immediate yard. A bird cooed and scolded its fledglings in an evergreen tree not a dozen feet away. He watched it feed its young. A hummingbird whizzed past his face, its invisible wings fanning the air with great rapidity. From flower to flower it darted on the creeping vines beside the house. He watched it lazily, fascinated by its beauty, its daintiness the music of its flight. Was it possible that he, in the midst of life, was on the threshold of death? Into his reverie broke the hum of a motor strangely familiar to his ears. It was Elton's car, he had no doubt. He strained his eyes to catch sight of it and confirmed his guess. Then he turned to go downstairs and let Elton in. On the morning of the 10th, Elton became very uneasy. He was sincere in what he told his friend Hall. He feared, however, that Hall would disregard the warning and come to disaster. Since, in most likelihood, Hall would not provide himself with a bodyguard, why not be that bodyguard himself? So Elton reasoned. It was precisely at the time when he made up his mind to attend Hall all that day that Hall telephoned him. He got his car from the garage and inspected the right front tire, concerning which Hall had been kidding him on more than one occasion. It was about ready to go out. But this was no time to change it. He could do that when he got to Hall's place, or later, or let it go until it did blow out. He was just slowing as he drew close to Hall's residence to make the turn into the driveway on the north side of the house, when the tire went out with a loud bang. He turned into the driveway on the rim, stopped, and quickly changed the tire. He might as well get it over with before going into the house, so he could wash up when he did go in. The tire changed. He went to the front door and pushed the bell. No answer came. He knocked long and loud. Still no answer. Worried at the silence, he started along the cement path that led to the rear around the south side of the house, and paused to stand aghast at what he saw when he turned the corner. As Hall turned, with intention of leaving the open window to admit his friend, the latter's tire had exploded. Hall, whose nerves were jumpy as a result of his friend's dire foreboding, started lost his balance, and fell backward out the window. He clutched at the vines, held to the side of the wall by metal netting, but they gave and tore away and let him continue to fall. And then one, more tenacious than the rest, held, but it wrapped its sinuous length around his neck. He fought and clutched the wire-like fiber, but the noose slipped only tighter. He was almost dead when Elton cut him down. The End of An Arc of Direction by Junius B. Smith
The Cheated Juliet by Q. Extracted from the memoirs of a retired burglar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames. The house in question was what Peter the scholar who corrects my proof-sheets, calls one of the Rusinerby sort. The front facing a street, and the back looking over a turfed garden with a lime-tree or two, a laburnum, and a lawn tennis-court marked out, its white lines plain to see in the starlight. At the end of the garden, a door, painted dark green, led into a narrow lane between high walls, where, if two persons met, one had to turn sideways to let the other pass. The entrance to this lane was cut in two by a wooden post about the height of your hip, and just beyond this, in the high road, George was waiting for us with the dog-cart. We had picked the usual time, the dinner hour. It had just turned dark, and the church clock two streets away was chiming the quarter after eight, when Peter and I let ourselves in by the green door I spoke of, and felt along the wall for the gardener's ladder that we knew was hanging there. A simpler job there never was. The bedroom window we had marked on the first floor stood right open to the night air, and inside there was the light of a candle or two flickering, just as a careless maid would leave them after her mistress had gone down to dinner. To be sure, there was a chance of her coming back to put them out, but we could hear her voice going in the servants' hall as we lifted the ladder and rested it against the sill. "'She's good for half an hour yet,' Peter whispered, holding the ladder while I began to climb. "'But if I hear her voice stop, I'll give the signal to be cautious.' I went up softly, pushed my head gently above the level of the sill, and looked in. It was a roomy place with a great half-tester bed, hung with curtains, standing out from the wall on my right. The curtains were of chintz, a dark background with flaming red poppies sprawling over it, and the further curtain hid the dressing-table, and the candles upon it, and the jewel-case that I confidently hoped to stand upon it also. A bright brussel carpet covered the floor, and the wallpaper I remember, though for the life of me I can't tell why, was a pale grey ground worked up to imitate watered silk, with sprigs of gilt honeysuckle upon it. I looked round and listened for half a minute. The house was still as death up here, not a sound in the room or in the passages beyond. With a nod to Peter to hold the ladder firm, I lifted one leg over the sill, then the other, dropped my feet carefully upon the thick carpet, and went quickly round the bed to the dressing-table. But at the corner, and as soon as ever I saw round the chintz curtain, my knees gave way, and I put out a hand towards the bedpost, before the dressing-table, and in front of the big glass, in which she could see my white face, was an old lady seated. She wore a blaze of jewels and a low gown out of which rose the scraggiest neck and shoulders I have ever looked on. Her hair was thick with black dye, and fastened with a diamond star. The powder between the two candles showed on her cheekbones like flower on a miller's coat. Chin on hand, she was gazing steadily into the mirror before her, and even in my fright I had time to note that a glass of sherry and a plate of rice and curry stood at her elbow, among the rouge-pots and powder-puffs. While I stood stock-still and pretty well scared out of my wits, she rose, still staring at my image in the glass, folded her hands modestly over her bosom, and spoke in a deep, tragical voice. The prince! Then, facing sharply round, she 
held out her thin arms. "'You have come at last!' There wasn't much to say to this except that I had. So I confessed it. Even with the candles behind her, I could see her eyes glowing like a dog's, and an uglier poor creature this world could scarcely know. Is the ladder against the window? Since you seem to know, ma'am, said I, it is. Ah, Romeo, your cheeks are ruddy, your poppies are too red. Then I'm glad my colours come back, for to tell the truth, you did give me a turn just at first. You were looking out for me, no doubt. My prince, she stretched out her arms again, and being pretty well at my wit's end, I let her embrace me. It has been so long, she said. Oh, the weary while, and they ill-treat me here. Where have you been all this tedious time? I wasn't going to answer that, you may be sure. It appeared to me that twas my right to ask questions rather than stand there answering them. If they've been ill-treating you, ma'am, said I, they shall answer for it. My love. Yes, ma'am. Would it be taking a liberty if I asked their names? There is Gertrude. Gertrude's hash is as good as settled, ma'am. I checked Gertrude off on my thumb. That's my niece. For a moment I feared I'd been a little too prompt, but she went on. And next there's Henry and the children, who have more than once made faces at me. And Phipson. Phipson's in it too? You know her. Don't I? It surprised me a trifle to find that Phipson was a female. Three times tonight she pulled my hair, and the rice she brought me, look at it, all stuck together and sodden. Phipson shall pay for it with her blood. My hero, my darling, don't spare Phipson. She screams bitterly if a pin is stuck into her. I did it once. Stick her all over with pins. By this I'd begun to guess what was pretty near the truth, that I was talking with a mad aunt of the family below, and that the game was in my hands if I played it with decent care. So I brought her to face the important question. Look here, I said. All this shall be done when you are out of their hands. At present I'm running a considerable risk in braving these persecutors of yawn. Dearest madam, the ladder's outside and the carriage waiting. Hadn't we better elope at once? She gave a sob and fell on my shoulders. Oh, it is true. Is it true? Pinch me that I may awake if this is but a happy dream. You are ready? This moment. There's just one other little matter, ma'am. Your jewels. You don't want to leave them to your enemies, I suppose. This was the dangerous moment, and I felt a twitch of the nerves as I watched her face to see how she would take the suggestion. But the poor, silly soul turned up her eyes to mine, and full of tears and confidence. Dearest, I am old. Old? Had you come earlier, my beauty had not wanted jewels to set it off. But now I must wear them to look my best, as your bride. She hid her face in her hands for a second, then turned to the dressing table, lifted her jewel case, and put it into my hands. I am ready, she repeated. Let us be quick and stealthy as death. She followed me to the window, and looking out, drew back. What horrible black depths! It's as easy, said I, as pie. You could do it on your head. Look here. I climbed out first and helped her, setting her feet on the rungs. We went down in silence, I choking with laughter all the way at the sight of Peter below, 
who was looking with his mouth open and his lips too weak to meet on the curses and wonderment that rose up from the depths of him. When I touched Turf and handed him the jewel case, he took it like a man in a trance. We put the ladder back into its place and stole over the turf together, but outside the garden door Peter could stand no more of it. I've a firearm in my pocket, whispered he, pulling up, and I'm going to fire it off to relieve my feelings if you don't explain, here and now, who in pity's name is she? You mug, she's the original sleeping beauty. I'm eloping with her, and you've got her jewels. Pardon me, Jem, he says in his gentlemanly way. If I don't quite see, are you taking her off to melt her or to marry her? Or how to get rid of her else? The poor old creature had halted too, three paces ahead of us, and waited while we whispered with the moonlight that slanted down into the lane, whitening her bare neck and flashing in her jewels. One moment, I said, and stepped forward to her. You had better take off those ornaments here, my dear, and give them to my servant to take care of. There's a carriage waiting for us at the end of the lane, and when he has stowed them under the seat, we can climb in and drive off. To the end of the world, to the very rim of it, my hero. She pulled the gems from her ears, hair, and bosom, and handed them to Peter, who received them with a bow. Next she searched in her pocket and drew out a tiny key. Peter unlocked the case, and having carefully stowed the diamonds inside, locked it again, handed back the key, touched his hat, and walked off towards the dog-cart. "'My dearest lady,' I began, as soon as we were alone between the high walls, "'if the devotion of a life—' Her bare arm crept into mine. "'There is but a little time left for us in which to be happy. Year after year I have marked off the almanac. Day by day I have watched the dial. I saw my sisters married, and my sisters' daughters, and still I waited. Each had a man to love her and tend her, but none had such a man as I would have chosen. There were none like you, my prince. No, I dare say not. Oh, but my heart is not so old. Take my hand. It is firm and strong. Touch my lips. They are burning. A low whistle sounded at the top of the lane. As I took her hands, I pushed her back, and turning, ran for my life. I suppose that, as I ran, I counted forty before her scream came, and then the sound of her feet pattering after me. She must have run like a demon for I was less than ten yards ahead when Peter caught my wrist and pulled me up onto the back seat of the dog-cart. And before George could set the horse going, her hand clutched at the flap on which my feet rested. It missed its grasp, and she never got near enough again. But for half a minute I looked into that horrible face following us, and working with silent rage, and for half a mile at least I heard the patter of her feet in the darkness behind. Indeed, I can hear it now. End of The Cheated Juliet by Q The Face in the Target by G. K. Chesterton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 1. The Face in the Target Harold March, the rising reviewer and social critic, was walking vigorously across a great tableland of moors and commons, the horizon of which was fringed with the far-off woods of the famous estate of Torwood Park. He was a good-looking young man in tweeds, with very pale curly hair and pale clear eyes. Walking in wind and sun in the very landscape of liberty, he was still young enough to remember his politics and not merely try to forget them. 
for his errand at Torwood Park was a political one. It was the place of appointment named by no less a person than the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Sir Howard Horn, then introducing his so-called socialist budget, and prepared to expound it in an interview with so promising a penman. Harold March was the sort of man who knows everything about politics and nothing about politicians. He also knew a great deal about art, letters, philosophy, and general culture, about almost everything indeed except the world he was living in. Abruptly in the middle of those sunny and windy flats, he came upon a sort of cleft almost narrow enough to be called a crack in the land. It was just large enough to be the water course for a small stream which vanished at intervals under green tunnels of undergrowth, as if in a dwarfish forest. Indeed, he had an odd feeling as if he were a giant looking over the valley of the pygmies. When he dropped into the hollow, however, the impression was lost. The rocky banks, though hardly above the height of a cottage, hung over and had the profile of a precipice. As he began to wander down the course of the stream in idle but romantic curiosity and saw the water shining in short strips between the great gray boulders and bushes as soft as great green mosses, he fell into quite an opposite vein of fantasy. It was rather as if the earth had opened and swallowed him into a sort of underworld of dreams, and when he became conscious of a human figure dark against the silver stream, sitting on a large boulder and looking rather like a large bird, it was perhaps with some of the premonitions proper to a man who meets the strangest friendship of his life. The man was apparently fishing, or at least was fixed in a fisherman's attitude with more than a fisherman's immobility. March was able to examine the man almost as if he had been a statue for some minutes before the statue spoke. He was a tall, fair man, cadaverous, and a little lackadaisical, with heavy eyelids and a high-bridged nose. When his face was shaded with his white, wide hat, his light mustache and lithe figure gave him a look of youth. But the Panama lay on the moss beside him, and the spectator could see that his brow was prematurely bald, and this, combined with a certain hollowness about the eyes, had an air of headwork and even headache. But the most curious thing about him, realized after a short scrutiny, was that though he looked like a fisherman, he was not fishing. He was holding, instead of a rod, something that might have been a landing net which some fishermen use, but which was more like the ordinary toy net which children carry and which they generally use indifferently for shrimps or butterflies. He was dipping this into the water at intervals, gravely regarding its harvest of weed or mud and emptying it out again. No, I haven't caught anything, he remarked calmly, as if answering an unspoken query. When I do, I have to throw it back again, especially the big fish, but some of the little beasts interest me when I get them. A scientific interest, I suppose, observed March. Of a rather amateurish sort. Of a rather amateurish sort, I fear, answered the strange fisherman. I have a sort of hobby about what they call phenomena of phosphorescence, but it would be rather awkward to go about in society carrying stinking fish. I suppose it would, said March with a smile. Rather odd to enter a drawing room carrying a large luminous cod, continued the stranger in his listless way. How quaint it would be if one could carry it about like a lantern, or have little sprats for candles. Some of the sea beasts would really be very pretty like lampshades, the blue sea snail that glitters all over like starlight, and some of the red starfish really shine like red stars. But naturally, I'm not looking for them here. March thought of asking him what he was looking for, but feeling unequal to a technical discussion at least as deep as the deep sea fishes, he returned to more ordinary topics. Delightful sort of hole this is, he said. This little dell and river here. It's like those places Stevenson talks about, where something ought to happen. I know, answered the other. I think it's because the place itself, so to speak, seems to happen and not merely to exist. Perhaps that's what old Picasso and some of the cubists are trying to express by angles and jagged lines. Look at that wall like low cliffs that juts forward just at right angles to the slope of turf sweeping up to it. That's like a silent collision. It's like a breaker and the backwash of a wave. March looked at the low-browed crag overhanging the green slope and nodded. He was interested in a man who turned so easily from the technicalities of science to those of art, and asked him if he admired the new angular artists. "'As I feel it, the cubists are not cubist enough,' replied the stranger. "'I mean, they're not thick enough. By making things mathematical, they make them thin. Take the living lines out of that landscape, simplify it to a right angle, and you flatten it out to a mere diagram on paper. Diagrams have their own beauty, but it is of just the other sort.' They stand for the unalterable things, the calm, eternal, mathematical sort of truths, what somebody calls the white radiance of... He stopped, and before the next word came, something had happened almost too quickly and completely to be realized. From behind the overhanging rock came a noise and rush like that of a railway train, and a great motor car appeared. It topped the crest of cliff, black against the sun, like a battle chariot rushing to destruction in some wild epic. March automatically put out his hand in one futile gesture, as if to catch a falling teacup in a drawing room. For the fraction of a flash it seemed to leave the ledge of rock like a flying ship, then the very sky seemed to turn over like a wheel, and it lay a ruin amid the tall grasses below, a line of grey smoke going up slowly from it into the silent air. A little lower the figure of a man with grey hair lay tumbled down the steep green slope, his limbs lying all at random and his face turned away. 
The eccentric fisherman dropped his net and walked swiftly toward the spot, his new acquaintance following him. As they drew near, there seemed a sort of monstrous irony in the fact that the dead machine was still throbbing and thundering as busily as a factory while the man lay so still. He was unquestionably dead. The blood flowed in the grass from a hopelessly fatal fracture at the back of the skull, but the face, which was turned to the sun, was uninjured and strangely arresting in itself. It was one of those cases of a strange face so unmistakable as to feel familiar. We feel somehow that we ought to recognize it even though we do not. It was of the broad, square sort with great jaws, almost like that of a highly intellectual ape, the wide mouth shut so tight as to be traced by a mere line, the nose short with the sort of nostrils that seemed to gape with an appetite for the air. The oddest thing about the face was that one of the eyebrows was cocked up at a much sharper angle than the other. March thought he had never seen a face so naturally alive as that dead one, and its ugly energy seemed all the stranger for its halo of hoary hair. Some papers lay half-fallen out of the pocket, and from among them March extracted a card case. He read the name on the card aloud. Sir Humphrey Turnbull. I'm sure I've heard that name somewhere. His companion only gave a sort of a little sigh and was silent for a moment, as if ruminating. Then he merely said, The poor fellow is quite gone, and added some scientific terms in which his auditor once more found himself out of his depth. As things are, continued the same curiously well-informed person, it will be more legal for us to leave the body as it is until the police are informed. In fact, I think it will be well if nobody except the police is informed. Don't be surprised if I seem to be keeping it dark from some of our neighbors round here. Then, as if prompted to regularize his rather abrupt confidence, he said, I've come down to see my cousin at Torwood. My name is Horn Fisher. Might be a pun on my pottering about here, mightn't it? Is Sir Howard Horn your cousin? asked March. I'm going to Torwood Park to see him myself. Only about his public work, of course, and the wonderful stand he is making for his principles. I think this budget is the greatest thing in English history. If it fails, it will be the most heroic failure in English history. Are you an admirer of your great kinsman, Mr. Fisher? Rather, said Mr. Fisher. He's the best shot I know. Then, as if sincerely repentant of his nonchalance, he added with a sort of enthusiasm, No, but really, he's a beautiful shot. As if fired by his own words, he took a sort of leap at the ledges of the rock above him and scaled them with a sudden agility and startling contrast to his general lassitude. He had stood for some seconds on the headland above, with his aquiline profile under the Panama that relieved against the sky and peering over the countryside before his companion had collected himself sufficiently to scramble up after him. The level above was a stretch of common turf on which the tracks of the faded car were ploughed plainly enough, but the brink of it was broken as with rocky teeth. Broken boulders of all shapes and sizes lay near the edge. It was almost incredible that anyone could have deliberately driven into such a death trap, especially in broad daylight. I can't make head or tail of it, said March. Was he blind or blind drunk? Neither, by the look of him, replied the other. Then it was suicide. It doesn't seem a cozy way of doing it, remarked the man called Fisher. Besides, I don't fancy poor old Puggy would commit suicide somehow. Poor old who, inquired the wondering journalist. Did you know this unfortunate man? Nobody knew him exactly, replied Fisher with some vagueness, but one knew him, of course. He'd been a terror in his time, in Parliament, in the courts, and so on especially in that row about the aliens who were deported as undesirables, when he wanted one of them hanged for murder. He was so sick about it that he retired from the bench. Since then he mostly motored about by himself, but he was coming to Torwood too for the weekend, and I don't see why he should deliberately break his neck almost at the very door. I believe Hoggs, I mean my cousin Howard, was coming down specially to meet him. Torwood Park doesn't belong to your cousin, inquired March. No, it used to belong to the Winthrops, you know, replied the other. Now a new man's got it, a man from Montreal named Jenkins. Hoggs comes for the shooting. I told you he was a lovely shot. This repeated eulogy on the great social statesman affected Harold March as if somebody had defined Napoleon as a distinguished player of Knapp. But he had another half-formed impression struggling in this flood of unfamiliar things, and he brought it to the surface before it could vanish. Jenkins, he repeated. Surely you don't mean Jefferson Jenkins, the social reformer. I mean the man who's fighting for the new cottage estate scheme? It would be as interesting to meet him as any cabinet minister in the world, if you'll excuse my saying so. Yes, Hoggs told him it would have to be cottages, said Fisher. He said the breed of cattle had improved too often and people were beginning to laugh. And of course, you must hang a peerage onto something, though the poor chap hasn't got it yet. Hello, here's somebody else. They had started walking in the tracks of the car, leaving it behind them in the hollow, still humming horribly like a huge insect that had killed a man. The tracks took them to the corner of the road, one arm of which went on in the same line toward the distant gates of the park. It was clear that the car had been driven down the long straight road, and then, instead of turning with the road to the left, had gone straight on over the turf to its doom. But it was not this discovery that had riveted Fisher's eye, but something even more solid. At the angle of the white road, a dark and solitary figure was standing almost as still as a finger post. 
It was that of a big man in rough shooting clothes, bareheaded and with tussled, curly hair that gave him a rather wild look. On a nearer approach, this first, more fantastic impression faded. In a full light, the figure took on more conventional colors, as of an ordinary gentleman who happened to have come out without a hat and without very studiously brushing his hair. But the massive stature remained, and something deep and even cavernous about the setting of the eyes redeemed his animal good looks from the commonplace. But March had no time to study the man more closely, for, much to his astonishment, his guide merely observed, "'Hello, Jack,' and walked past him as if he had indeed been a signpost, and without attempting to inform him of the catastrophe beyond the rocks. It was relatively a small thing, but it was only the first in a string of singular antics on which his new and eccentric friend was leading him. The man they had passed looked after them in rather a suspicious fashion, but Fisher continued serenely on his way along the straight road that ran past the gates of the great estate. "'That's John Burke, the traveler,' he condescended to explain." I expect you've heard of him. Shoots big game and all that. Sorry I couldn't stop to introduce you, but I dare say you'll meet him later on. I know his book, of course, said March with renewed interest. That is certainly a fine piece of description about their being only conscious of the closeness of the elephant when the colossal head blocked out the moon. Yes, young Halkett writes jolly well, I think. What, didn't you know Halkett wrote Burke's book for him? Burke can't use anything except a gun, and you can't write with that. Oh, he's genuine enough in his way, you know, as brave as a lion, or a good deal braver by all accounts. You seem to know all about him, observed March with a rather bewildered laugh, and about a good many other people. Fisher's bald brow became abruptly corrugated and a curious expression came into his eyes. I know too much, he said. That's what's the matter with me. That's what's the matter with all of us and the whole show. We know too much. Too much about one another, too much about ourselves. That's why I'm really interested, just now, about one thing that I don't know. And that is, inquired the other, why that poor fellow is dead. They had walked along the straight road for nearly a mile, conversing at intervals in this fashion, and March had a singular sense of the whole world being turned inside out. Mr. Hornfisher did not especially abuse his friends and relatives in fashionable society. Of some of them he spoke with affection. But they seemed to be an entirely new set of men and women, who happened to have the same nerves as the men and women mentioned most often in the newspapers. Yet no fury of revolt could have seemed to him more utterly revolutionary than this cold familiarity. It was like daylight on the other side of stage scenery. They reached the great lodge gates of the park, and, to March's surprise, passed them and continued along the interminable, white, straight road. But he was himself too early for his appointment with Sir Howard, and was not disinclined to see the end of his new friend's experiment, whatever it might be. They had long left the moorland behind them, and half the white road was gray in the great shadow of the torwood pine forest, themselves like gray bars shuttered against the sunshine and within, amid that clear noon, manufacturing their own midnight. Soon, however, rifts began to appear in them like gleams of colored windows. The trees thinned and fell away as the road went forward, showing the wild, irregular copses in which, as Fisher said, the house party had been blazing away all day, and about two hundred yards farther on they came to the first turn of the road. At the corner stood a sort of decayed inn with the dingy sign of the grapes. The signboard was dark and indecipherable by now and hung black against the sky and the gray moorland beyond, about as inviting as a gallows. March remarked that it looked like a tavern for vinegar instead of wine. A good phrase, said Fisher, and so it would be if you were silly enough to drink wine in it. But the beer is very good, and so is the brandy. March followed him to the bar parlor with some wonder, and his dim sense of repugnance was not dismissed by the first sight of the innkeeper, who was widely different from the genial innkeepers of romance. A bony man, very silent behind a black mustache, but with black, restless eyes. Taciturn as he was, the investigator succeeded at last in extracting a scrap of information from him, by dint of ordering beer and talking to him persistently and minutely on the subject of motor cars. He evidently regarded the innkeeper as in some singular way an authority on motor cars, as being deep in the secrets of the mechanism, management, and mismanagement of motor cars, holding the man all the time with a glittering eye like the ancient mariner. Out of all this rather mysterious conversation, there did emerge at last a sort of admission that one particular motor car of a given description had stopped before the inn about an hour before, and that an elderly man had alighted, requiring some mechanical assistance. Asked if the visitor required any other assistance, the innkeeper said shortly that the old gentleman had filled his flask and taken a packet of sandwiches. And with these words, the somewhat inhospitable host had walked hastily out of the bar, and they heard him banging doors in the dark interior. Fisher's weary eye wandered round the dusty and dreary inn parlor and rested dreamily on a glass case containing a stuffed bird with a gun hung on hooks above it, which seemed to be its only ornament. Puggy was a humorist, he observed, at least in his own rather grim style but it seems rather too grim a joke for a man to buy a packet of sandwiches when he is just going to commit suicide. 
If you come to that, answered March, it isn't very usual for a man to buy a packet of sandwiches when he's just outside the door of a grand house he's going to stop at. No, no, repeated Fisher, almost mechanically, and then suddenly cocked his eye at his interlocutor with a much livelier expression. By Jove, that's an idea, you're perfectly right, and that suggests a very queer idea, doesn't it? There was a silence, and then March started with irrational nervousness as the door of the inn was flung open and another man walked rapidly to the counter. He had struck it with a coin and called out for brandy before he saw the other two guests who were sitting at a bare wooden table under the window. When he turned about with a rather wild stare, March had yet another unexpected emotion, for his guide hailed the man as Hogs and introduced him as Sir Howard Horn. He looked rather older than his boyish portraits in the illustrated papers, as is the way of politicians. His flat, fair hair was touched with gray, but his face was almost comically round, with a Roman nose which, when combined with his quick, bright eyes, raised a vague reminiscence of a parrot. He had a cap rather at the back of his head and a gun under his arm. Harold March had imagined many things about his meeting with the great political reformer, but he had never pictured him with a gun under his arm, drinking brandy in a public house. "'So you're stopping at Jinx, too,' said Fisher. "'Everybody seems to be at Jinx.' "'Yes,' replied the Chancellor of the Exchequer. "'Jolly good shooting, at least all of it that isn't. Jinx shooting. I never knew a chap with such good shooting that was such a bad shot. Mind you, he's a jolly good fellow and all that. I don't say a word against him. But he never learned to hold a gun when he was packing pork or whatever he did. They say he shot the cockade off his own servant's hat. Just like him to have cockades, of course. He shot the weathercock off his own ridiculous gilded summer house. It's the only cock he'll ever kill, I should think. Are you coming up there now? Fisher said, rather vaguely, that he was following soon when he had fixed something up, and the Chancellor of the Exchequer left the inn. March fancied he had been a little upset or impatient when he called for the brandy, but he had talked himself back into a satisfactory state. If the talk had not been quite what his literary visitor had expected. Fisher, a few minutes afterwards, slowly led the way out of the tavern and stood in the middle of the road looking down in the direction from which they had traveled. Then he walked back about two hundred yards in that direction and stood still again. "'I should think this is about the place,' he said." "'What place?' asked his companion. "'The place where the poor fellow was killed,' said Fisher sadly. "'What do you mean?' demanded March. "'He was smashed up on the rocks a mile and a half from here.' "'No, he wasn't,' replied Fisher. "'He didn't fall on the rocks at all. "'Didn't you notice that he only fell on the slope of soft grass underneath? "'But I saw that he had a bullet in him already.' "'Then, after a pause, he added, "'He was alive at the inn, but he was dead long before he came to the rocks. "'So he was shot as he drove his car down this strip of straight road, "'and I should think somewhere about here.' After that, of course, the car went straight on with nobody to stop or turn it. It's really a very cunning dodge in its way, for the body would be found far away and most people would say, as you do, that it was an accident to a motorist. The murderer must have been a clever brute. But wouldn't the shot be heard at the inn or somewhere? asked March. It would be heard, but it would not be noticed. That, continued the investigator, is where he was clever again. Shooting was going on all over the place all day. Very likely he timed his shot so as to drown it in a number of others. Certainly he was a first-class criminal, and he was something else as well. What do you mean? asked his companion with a creepy premonition of something coming. He knew not why. He was a first-class shot, said Fisher. He had turned his back abruptly and was walking down a narrow, grassy lane, little more than a cart track, which lay opposite the inn and marked the end of the great estate in the beginning of the open moors. March plodded after him with the same idle perseverance and found him staring through a gap in giant weeds and thorns at the flat face of a painted paling. From behind the paling rose the great gray columns of a row of poplars which filled the heavens above them with dark green shadow and shook faintly in a wind which had sunk slowly into a breeze. The afternoon was already deepening into evening and the titanic shadows of the poplars lengthened over a third of the landscape. "'Are you a first-class criminal?' asked Fisher in a friendly tone. "'I'm afraid I'm not, but I think I can manage to be a sort of fourth-rate burglar.' And before his companion could reply, he had managed to swing himself up and over the fence." March followed without much bodily effort, but with considerable mental disturbance. The poplars grew so close against the fence that they had some difficulty in slipping past them, and beyond the poplars they could see only a high hedge of laurel, green and lustrous in the level sun. Something in this limitation by a series of living walls made him feel as if he were really entering a shattered house instead of an open field. It was as if he came in by a disused door or window and found the way blocked by furniture. When they had circumvented the laurel hedge, they came out on a sort of terrace of turf, which fell by one green step to an oblong lawn like a bowling green. Beyond this was the only building in sight, a low conservatory which seemed far away from anywhere, like a glass cottage standing in its own fields in a fairyland. Fisher knew that lonely look of the outlying parts of a great house well enough. He realized that it is more of a satire on aristocracy than if it were choked with weeds and littered with ruins. For it is not neglected, and yet it is deserted. At any rate, it is disused. It is regularly swept and garnished for a master who never comes. 
Looking over the lawn, however, he saw one object which he had not apparently expected. It was a sort of tripod supporting a large disc like the round top of a table tipped sideways, and it was not until they had dropped onto the lawn and walked across to look at it that March realized that it was a target. It was worn and weather-stained, the gay colors of its concentric rings were faded. Possibly it had been set up in those far-off Victorian days when there was a fashion of archery. March had one of his vague visions of ladies in cloudy crinolines and gentlemen in outlandish hats and whiskers revisiting that lost garden like ghosts. Fisher, who was peering more closely at the target, startled him by an exclamation. Hello, he said. Somebody has been peppering this thing with shot, after all, and quite lately, too. Why, I believe old Jinx been trying to improve his bad shooting here. Yes, and it looks as if it still wanted improving, answered March, laughing. Not one of these shots is anywhere near the bullseye. They seem just scattered about in the wildest way. In the wildest way, repeated Fisher, still peering intently at the target. He seemed merely to assent, but March fancied his eye was shining under its sleepy lid and that he straightened his stooping figure with a strange effort. Excuse me a moment, he said, feeling in his pockets. I think I've got some of my chemicals, and after that we'll go up to the house. And he stooped again over the target, putting something with his finger over each of the shot holes, so far as March could see, merely a dull gray smear. Then they went through the gathering twilight up the long green avenues to the great house. Here again, however, the eccentric investigator did not enter by the front door. He walked round the house until he found a window open, and, leaping into it, introduced his friend to what appeared to be the gun room. Rows of the regular instruments for bringing down birds stood against the walls, but across the table in the window lay one or two weapons of a heavier and more formidable pattern. Hello. These are Burke's big game rifles, said Fisher. I never knew he kept them here. He lifted one of them, examined it briefly, and put it down again, frowning heavily. Almost as he did so, a strange young man came hurriedly into the room. He was dark and sturdy with a bumpy forehead and a bulldog jaw, and he spoke with a curt apology. I left Major Burke's guns here, he said, and he wants them packed up. He's going away tonight. And he carried off the two rifles without casting a glance at the stranger. Through the open window, they could see his short, dark figure walking away across the glimmering garden. Fisher got out of the window again and stood looking after him. That's Halkett, whom I told you about, he said. I knew he was a sort of secretary and had to do with Burke's papers, but I never knew he had anything to do with his guns. But he's just the sort of silent, sensible little devil who might be very good at anything. The sort of man you know for years before you find he's a chess champion. He had begun to walk in the direction of the disappearing secretary, and they soon came within sight of the rest of the house party talking and laughing on the lawn. They could see the tall figure and loose mane of the lion hunter dominating the little group. By the way, observed Fisher, when we were talking about Burke and Halkett, I said that a man couldn't very well write with a gun. Well, I'm not so sure now. Did you ever hear of an artist so clever that he could draw with a gun? There's a wonderful chap loose about here. Sir Howard hailed Fisher and his friend, the journalist, with almost boisterous amiability. The latter was presented to Major Burke and Mr. Halkett, and also, by way of a parenthesis, to his host, Mr. Jenkins, a commonplace little man in loud tweeds whom everybody else seemed to treat with a sort of affection, as if he were a baby. The irrepressible Chancellor of the Exchequer was still talking about the birds he had brought down, the birds that Burke and Halkett had brought down, and the birds that Jenkins, their host, had failed to bring down. It seemed to be a sort of sociable monomania. You and your big game, he ejaculated aggressively to Burke. Why, anybody could shoot big game. You want to be a shot to shoot small game. Quite so, interposed Hornfisher. Now, if only a hippopotamus could fly up in the air out of that bush, or you preserved flying elephants on the estate, why then? Why, even Jink might hit that sort of bird, cried Sir Howard, hilariously slapping his host on the back. Even he might hit a haystack or a hippopotamus. Look here, you fellows, said Fisher. I want you to come along with me for a minute and shoot at something else. Not a hippopotamus. Another kind of queer animal I found on the estate. It's an animal with three legs and one eye, and it's all the colors of the rainbow. What the deuce are you talking about? asked Burke. You come along and see, replied Fisher cheerfully. Such people seldom reject anything nonsensical, for they are always seeking for something new. They gravely rearmed themselves from the gunroom and trooped along at the tail of their guide, Sir Howard, only pausing in a sort of ecstasy to point out the celebrated gilt summer house on which the gilt weathercock still stood crooked. It was dusk turning to dark by the time they reached the remote green by the poplars and accepted the new and aimless game of shooting at the old mark. The last light seemed to fade from the lawn, and the poplars against the sunset were like great plumes upon a purple hearse when the futile procession finally curved round and came out in front of the target. Sir Howard again slapped his host on the shoulder, shoving him playfully forward to take the first shot. The shoulder and arm he touched seemed unnaturally stiff and angular. Mr. Jenkins was holding his gun in an attitude more awkward than any that his satiric friends had seen or expected. At the same instant, a horrible scream seemed to come from nowhere. 
It was so unnatural and so unsuited to the scene that it might have been made by some inhuman thing flying on wings above them, or eavesdropping in the dark woods beyond. But Fisher knew that it had started and stopped on the pale lips of Jefferson Jenkins, of Montreal, and no one at that moment catching sight of Jefferson Jenkins' face would have complained that it was commonplace. The next moment a torrent of guttural but good-humored oaths came from Major Burke as he and the two other men saw what it was in front of them. The target stood up in the dim grass like a dark goblin grinning at them, and it was literally grinning. It had two eyes like stars, and in similar livid points of light were picked out the two upturned and open nostrils and the two ends of the wide and tight mouth. A few white dots above each eye indicated the hoary eyebrows, and one of them ran upward almost erect. It was a brilliant caricature done in bright dotted lines, and March knew of whom. It shone in the shadowy grass, smeared with sea fire, as if one of the submarine monsters had crawled into the twilight garden. But it had the head of a dead man. "'It's only luminous paint,' said Burke. "'Old Fisher's been having a joke with that phosphorescent stuff of his. "'Seems to be meant for old Puggy,' observes Sir Howard. "'Hits him off very well.' "'With that they all laughed except Jenkins. "'When they had all done, he made a noise like the first effort of an animal to laugh, "'and Horn Fisher suddenly strode across to him and said, "'Mr. Jenkins, I must speak to you at once in private.' "'It was by the little water course in the moors, on the slope under the hanging rock, that March met his new friend Fisher by appointment, shortly after the ugly and almost grotesque scene that had broken up the group in the garden. It was a monkey trick of mine, observed Fisher gloomily, putting phosphorus on the target, but the only chance to make him jump was to give him the horrors suddenly, and when he saw the face he'd shot at shining on the target he practiced on, all lit up with an infernal light, he did jump, quite enough for my own intellectual satisfaction. I'm afraid I don't quite understand even now, said March, exactly what he did or why he did it. "'You ought to,' replied Fisher with his rather dreary smile, "'for you gave me the first suggestion yourself. "'Oh, yes, you did, and it was a very shrewd one. "'You said a man wouldn't take sandwiches with him to dine at a great house. "'It was quite true, and the inference was that, though he was going there, "'he didn't mean to dine there, or, at any rate, that he might not be dining there. "'It occurred to me at once that he probably expected the visit to be unpleasant "'or the reception doubtful, or something that would prevent his accepting hospitality.' Then it struck me that Turnbull was a terror to certain shady characters in the past, and that he had come down to identify and denounce one of them. The chances at the start pointed to the host, that is, Jenkins. I'm morally certain now that Jenkins was the undesirable alien Turnbull wanted to convict in another shooting affair. But you see, the shooting gentleman had another shot in his locker. But you said he would have to be a very good shot, protested March. Jenkins is a very good shot, said Fisher, a very good shot who can pretend to be a very bad shot. "'Shall I tell you the second hint I hit on after yours to make me think it was Jenkins? "'It was my cousin's account of his bad shooting. "'He'd shot a cockade off a hat and a weathercock off a building. "'Now, in fact, a man must shoot very well indeed to shoot so badly as that. "'He must shoot very neatly to hit the cockade and not the head, or even the hat. "'If the shots had really gone at random, "'the chances are a thousand to one that they would not have hit such prominent and picturesque objects. "'They were chosen because they were prominent and picturesque objects. "'They make a story to go the round of society.' He keeps the crooked weathercock in the summer house to perpetuate the story of a legend, and then he lay in wait with his evil eye and wicked gun safely ambushed behind the legend of his own incompetence. But there is more than that. There is the summer house itself. I mean, there is the whole thing. There's all that Jenkins gets chafed about, the gilding and the gaudy colors and all the vulgarity that's supposed to stamp him as an upstart. Now, as a matter of fact, upstarts generally don't do this. God knows there's enough of them in society, and one knows them well enough and this is the very last thing they do. They're generally only too keen to know the right thing and do it, and they instantly put themselves body and soul into the hands of art decorators and art experts who do the whole thing for them. There's hardly another millionaire alive who has the moral courage to have a gilt monogram on a chair like that one in the gun room. For that matter, there's the name as well as the monogram. Names like Tompkins and Jenkins and Jinx are funny without being vulgar. I mean, they are vulgar without being common. If you prefer it, they are commonplace without being common. They are just the names to be chosen to look ordinary, but they're really rather extraordinary. Do you know many people called Tompkins? It's a good deal rarer than Talbot. It's pretty much the same with the comic clothes of the parvenu. Jenkins dresses like a character in Punch. But that's because he is a character in Punch. I mean, he's a fictitious character. He's a fabulous animal. He doesn't exist. Have you ever considered what it must be like to be a man who doesn't exist? I mean, to be a man with a fictitious character that he has to keep up at the expense not merely of personal talents? to be a new kind of hypocrite hiding a talent and a new kind of napkin. This man has chosen his hypocrisy very ingeniously. It was really a new one. A subtle villain has dressed up as a dashing gentleman and a worthy businessman and a philanthropist and a saint, but the loud checks of a comical little cad were really rather a new disguise. 
but the disguise must be very irksome to a man who can really do things. This is a dexterous little cosmopolitan gutter snipe who can do scores of things, not only shoot, but draw and paint and probably play the fiddle. Now a man like that may find the hiding of his talents useful, but he could never help wanting to use them where they were useless. If he can draw, he will draw absent-mindedly on blotting paper. I suspect this rascal has often drawn poor old Puggy's face on blotting paper. Probably he began doing it in blots as he afterward did it in dots, or rather shots. It was the same sort of thing. He found a disused target in a deserted yard and couldn't resist indulging in a little secret shooting, like secret drinking. You thought the shots all scattered and irregular, and so they were, but not accidental. No two distances were alike, but the different points were exactly where he wanted to put them. There's nothing needs such mathematical precision as a wild caricature. I've dabbled a little in drawing myself, and I assure you that to put one dot where you want it is a marvel with a pin close to a piece of paper. It was a miracle to do it across a garden with a gun. But a man who can work those miracles will always itch to work them, if it's only in the dark. After a pause, March observed, thoughtfully, but he couldn't have brought him down like a bird with one of those little guns. No, that was why I went into the gun room, replied Fisher. He did it with one of Burke's rifles, and Burke thought he knew the sound of it. That's why he rushed out without a hat, looking so wild. He saw nothing but a car passing quickly, which he followed for a little way, and then concluded he'd made a mistake. There was another silence, during which Fisher sat on a great stone as motionless as on their first meeting and watched the grey and silver river eddying past under the bushes. Then March said abruptly, "'Of course he knows the truth now.' "'Nobody knows the truth but you and I,' answered Fisher with a certain softening in his voice, "'and I don't think you and I will ever quarrel.' "'What do you mean?' asked March in an altered accent. "'What have you done about it?' Horn Fisher continued to gaze steadily at the eddying stream. At last, he said, the police have proved it was a motor accident. But you know it was not. I told you that I know too much, replied Fisher with his eye on the river. I know that, and I know a great many other things. I know the atmosphere and the way the whole thing works. I know this fellow has succeeded in making himself something incurably commonplace and comic. I know you can't get up a persecution of old Tool or Little Titch. If I were to tell Hoggs or Halkett that old Jink was an assassin, they would almost die of laughter before my eyes. Oh, I don't say their laughter's quite innocent, though it's genuine in its way. They want old Jink, and they couldn't do without him. I don't say I'm quite innocent. I like Hoggs, I don't want him to be down and out, and he'd be done for if Jink can't pay for his coronet. They were devilish near the line at the last election, but the only real objection to it is that it's impossible. Nobody would believe it. It's not in the picture. The crooked weathercock would always turn it into a joke. Don't you think this is infamous? asked March quietly. I think a good many things, replied the other. If you people ever happen to blow the whole tangle of society to hell with dynamite, I don't know that the human race will be much the worse. But don't be too hard on me merely because I know what society is. That's why I moon away my time over things like stinking fish. There was a pause as he settled himself down again by the stream, and then he added, I told you before I had to throw back the big fish. End of The Face in the Target by G.K. Chesterton The Grave, a story of stark terror, by Orville R. Emerson, from Weird Tales, March 1923. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Grave, by Orville R. Emerson. The end of the story was first brought to my attention when Fromwiller returned from his trip to Mount Kemmel with a very strange tale indeed, and one extremely hard to believe. But I believed enough of it to go back to the Mount with Fromm and see if we could discover anything more. And after digging for a while at the place where Fromm's story began, we made our way into an old dugout that had been caved in, or at least where all the entrances had been filled with dirt, and where we found, written on German correspondence paper, a terrible story. We found the story on Christmas Day, 1916, from Watteau and Flanders, where our regiment was stationed. Of course, you have heard of Mount Kemmel in Flanders. More than once it figured in newspaper reports as it changed hands during some of the fiercest fighting of the war. And when the Germans were finally driven from this point of vantage, 
in October 1918, a retreat was started which did not end until it became a race to see who could get to Germany first. The advance was so fast that the victorious British and French forces had no time to bury their dead, and, terrible as it may seem to those who have not seen it, in December of that year one could see the rotting corpses of the unburied dead scattered here and there over the top of Mount Kemmel. It was a place of ghostly sightings and sickening odors. And it was there that we found this tale. With the chaplain's help, we translated the story, which follows. For two weeks I have been buried alive. For two weeks I have not seen daylight, nor heard the sound of another person's voice. Unless I can find something to do, besides this everlasting digging, I shall go mad. So I shall write. As long as my candles last, I will pass part of the time each day in setting down on paper my experiences. Not that I need to do this in order to remember them. God knows that when I get out, the first thing I shall do will be try to forget them. But if I should not get out. I am an Oberlieutenant in the Imperial German Army. Two weeks ago my regiment was holding Mount Kemmel in Flanders. We were surrounded on three sides and subjected to a terrific artillery fire, but on account of the commanding position we were ordered to hold them out to the last man. Our engineers, however, had made things very comfortable. Numerous deep dugouts had been constructed, and in them we were comparatively safe from the shell fire. Many of these had been connected by passageways, so that there was a regular little underground city, and the majority of the garrison never left the protection of the dugouts. But even under these conditions our casualties were heavy. Lookouts had to be maintained above ground, and once in a while a direct hit by one of the huge railway guns would even destroy some of the dugouts. A little over two weeks ago, I can't be sure because I have lost track of the exact number of days, the usual shelling was increased a hundredfold. With about twenty others, I was sleeping in one of the shallower dugouts. The tremendous increase in shelling awakened me with a start, and my first impulse was to go at once into a deeper dugout, which was connected to the one I was in by an underground passageway. It was a smaller dugout, built a few feet lower than the one I was in. It had been used as a sort of storeroom, and no one was supposed to sleep there. But it seemed safer to me, and, alone, I crept into it. A thousand times since, I have wished I had taken another man with me. But my chances for doing it were soon gone. I had hardly entered the smaller dugout when there was a tremendous explosion behind me. The ground shook as if a mine had exploded below us. Whether that was indeed the case, or whether some extra large caliber explosive shell had struck the dugout behind me, I never knew. After the shock of the explosion had passed, I went back to the passageway. When about halfway along it, I found the timbers had fallen, allowing the earth to settle, and my way was effectively blocked. So I returned to the dugout and waited alone through several hours of terrific shelling. The only other entrance to the dugout I was in was the main entrance from the trench above, and all those who had been above ground had gone into dugouts long before this. So I could not expect anyone to enter while the shelling continued, and when it ceased there would surely be an attack. As I did not want to be killed by a grenade thrown down the entrance, I remained awake in order to rush out at the first signs of cessation of the bombardment, and join what comrades there may be left on the hill. After about six hours of heavy bombardment, all sound above ground seemed to cease. Five minutes went by, then ten. Surely the attack was coming. 
I rushed to the stairway leading to the air. I took a couple of strides up the stairs. There was a blinding flash and a deafening explosion. I felt myself falling. The darkness swallowed everything. How long I lay unconscious in the dugout I never knew, but after what seemed like a long time, I practically grew conscious of a dull ache in my left arm. I could not move it. I opened my eyes and found only darkness. I felt pain and a stiffness all over my body. Slowly I rose, struck a match, found a candle, and lit it, and looked at my watch. It had stopped. I did not know how long I had remained there unconscious. All the noise of the bombardment had ceased. I stood and listened for some time, but could hear no sound of any kind. My gaze fell on the stairway entrance. I started in alarm. The end of the dugout, where the entrance was, was half filled with dirt. I went over and looked closer. The entrance was completely filled with dirt at the bottom, and no light of any kind could be seen from above. I went to the passageway, to the other dugout, although I remembered it had caved in. I examined the fallen timbers closely. Between two of them I could feel a slight movement of air. Here was an opening to the outside world. I tried to move the timbers as well as I could with one arm, only to precipitate a small avalanche of dirt which filled the crack. Quickly I dug at the dirt until I could feel the movement of air. This might be the only place where I could obtain fresh air. I was convinced that it would take some little work to open up either of the passages, and I began to feel hungry. Luckily, there was a good supply of canned foods and hard bread, for the officers had kept their rations stored in the dugout. I also found a keg of water and about a dozen bottles of wine, which I discovered to be very good. After I had relieved my appetite and finished one of the bottles of wine, felt sleepy and, although my left arm pained me considerably, I soon dropped off to sleep. The time I have allowed myself for writing is up, so I will stop for today. After I have performed my daily task of digging tomorrow, I shall again write. Already my mind feels easier. Surely help will come soon. At any rate, Within two more weeks, I shall have liberated myself. Already I am halfway up the stairs, and my rations will last that long. I have divided them so they will. Yesterday I did not feel like writing after I finished my digging. My arm pained me considerably. I guess I used it too much. But today I was more careful with it, and it feels better and I am worried again. Twice today, big piles of earth caved in, where the timbers above were loose, and every time as much dirt fell into the passageway as I can remove in a day. Two days more before I can count on getting out by myself. The rations will have to be stretched out some more. The daily amount is already pretty small, but I shall go on with my account. From the time I became conscious I started my watch, and since then I have kept track of the days. On the second day I took stock of the food, water, wood, matches, candles, etc., and found a plentiful supply for two weeks at least. At the time I did not look forward to staying more than a few days in my prison. Either the enemy or ourselves will occupy the hill, I told myself because it is such an important position. And whoever holds the hill will be compelled to dig in deeply in order to hold it. So, to my mind, it was only a matter of a few days until either the entrance or the passageway would be cleared, and my only doubts were as to whether it would be friends or enemies 
that would discover me. My arm felt better, though I could not use it much, and so I spent the day in reading an old newspaper which I found among the food supplies, and in waiting for help to come. What a fool I was! If I only worked from the start, I would be just that many days nearer deliverance. On the third day I was annoyed by water, which began dripping from the roof and seeping in at the sides of the dugout. I cursed that muddy water then, as I have often cursed such dugout nuisances before. But it may be that I shall yet bless that water, and it will save my life. But it certainly made things uncomfortable, so I spent the day in moving my bunk, food, and water supplies, candles, etc., up into the passageway. For a space of about ten feet it is unobstructed, and being slightly higher than the dugout, was drier and more comfortable. Besides, the air has been much better here, as I had found that practically all my supplies of fresh air came in through the crack between the timbers, and I thought maybe the rats wouldn't bother me so much at night. Again I spent the balance of the day simply in waiting for help. It was not until well into the fourth day that I really began to feel uneasy. It suddenly began to impress on my consciousness that I had not heard the sound of a gun or felt the earth shake from the force of a concussion since the fatal shell that had filled the entrance. What was the meaning of the silence? Why did I hear no sounds of fighting? It was as still as the grave. What a horrible death to die, buried alive! A panic of fear swept over me. But my will and reason reasserted itself. In time I should be able to dig myself out by my own efforts. It would take time, but it could be done. So, although I could not use my left arm as yet, I spent the rest of that day and all of the two following days in digging dirt from the entrance and carrying it back into the far corner of the dugout. On the seventh day after regaining consciousness, I was tired and stiff from my unwanted exertions of the three previous days. I could see by this time that it was a matter of weeks, two or three at least, before I could hope to liberate myself. I might be rescued at an earlier date, but without outside aid it would take probably three more weeks of labor before I could dig my way out. Already dirt had caved in from the top where the timbers had sprung apart, and I could repair the damage to the roof of the stairway only in a crude way with one arm. But my left arm was much better. With a day's rest I would be able to use it pretty well. Besides, I must conserve my energy. So I spent the seventh day in rest and prayer for my speedy release from a living grave. I also reapportioned my food on the basis of three more weeks. It made the daily portions pretty small, especially as the digging was strenuous work. There was a large supply of candles so that I had plenty of light for my work, but the supply of water bothered me. Almost half of the small keg was gone in the first week. I decided to drink only once a day. The following six days were all days of feverish labor light eating, and even lighter drinking. But despite all my efforts, only a quarter of a keg was left at the end of two weeks, and the horror of the situation grew on me. My imagination would not be quiet. I would picture to myself the agonies to come when I would have even less food and water than at present. My mind would run on and on to death by starvation to the finding of my emaciated body by those who would eventually open up the dugout, even to their attempts to reconstruct the story of my end. And, adding to my physical discomfort, were the swarming vermin infesting the dugout and my person. A month had gone by since I had had a bath, and I could not now spare a drop of water even to wash my face. The rats had become so bold 
that I had to leave a candle burning all night in order to protect myself in my sleep. Partly to relieve my mind, I started to write this tale of my experiences. It did act as a relief at first, but now, as I read it over, the growing terror of this awful place grips me. I would cease writing, but some impulse urges me to write each day. Three weeks have passed since I was buried in this living tomb. Today I drank the last drop of water in the keg. There is a pool of stagnant water on the dugout floor, dirty, slimy, and alive with vermin, always standing there, fed by drippings from the roof. As yet, I cannot bring myself to touch it. Today I divided up my food supply for another week. God knows the portions were already small enough. But there have been so many cave-ins recently that I can never finish clearing the entrance in another week. Sometimes I feel that I shall never clear it. But I must. I can never bear to die here. I must will myself to escape, and I shall escape. Did not the captain often say that the will to win is half the victory? I shall rest no more. Every waking hour must be spent in removing the treacherous dirt. Even my writing must cease. Oh, God! I'm afraid, afraid! I must write to relieve my mind. Last night I went to sleep at nine by my watch. At twelve I woke to find myself in the dark, frantically digging with my bare hands at the dark sides of the dugout. After some trouble I found a candle and lit it. The whole dugout was upset. My food supplies were lying in the mud. The box of candles had been spilled. My fingernails were broken and bloody from clawing at the ground. The realization dawned upon me that I had been out of my head. And then came the fear. Dark, raging fear. Fear of insanity. I have been drinking the stagnant water from the floor for days. I do not know how many. I have only one meal left, but I must save it. I had a meal today. For three days I have been without food. But today I caught one of the rats that infest the place. It was a big one, too. Gave me a bad bite, but I killed him. I feel lots better today. Have had some bad dreams lately, but they don't bother me now. That rat was tough, though. Think I'll finish this digging and go back to my regiment in a day or two. Heaven have mercy. I must be out of my head half the time now. I have absolutely no recollection of having written that last entry. And I feel feverish and weak. If I had my strength, I think I could finish clearing the entrance in a day or two. But I can only work a short time at a stretch. I am beginning to give up hope. Wild spells come on me oftener now. I awake tired from the exertions which I cannot remember. Bones of rats, picked clean, are scattered about. Yet I do not remember eating them. In my lucid moments I don't seem to be able to catch them, for they are too wary, and I am too weak. I get some relief by chewing the candles, but I dare not eat them all. I am afraid of the dark, I am afraid of the rats, but worst of all is the hideous fear of myself. My mind is breaking down. I must escape soon, or I will be little better than a wild animal. Oh, God, send help. I'm going mad. Terror, desperation, despair. Is this the end? For a long time I have been resting. I have had a brilliant idea. Rest brings back strength. The longer a person rests, the stronger they should get. 
I have been resting a long time now. Weeks or months. I don't know which. So I must be very strong. I feel strong. My fever has left me. So listen. There is only a little dirt left in the entranceway. I am going out and crawl through it, just like a mole, right out into the sunlight. I feel much stronger than a mole. So this is the end of my little tale. A sad tale, but one with a happy ending. Sunlight. A very happy ending. And that was the end of the manuscript. There only remains to tell Frommeler's tale. At first I didn't believe it, but now I do. I shall put it down, though, just as Frommeler told it to me, and you can take it or leave it as you choose. Soon after we were billeted at Watow, said Frommeler, I decided to go out and see Mount Camel. I had heard that things were rather gruesome out there, but I was really not prepared for the conditions that I found. I had seen unburied dead at Rulus and in the Argonne, but it had been almost two months since the fighting on Mount Kemmel, and there were still many unburied dead. But there was another thing that I had never seen, and that was the buried living. As I came to the highest point on the mount, I was attracted by a movement of loose dirt on the edge of a huge shell hole. The dirt seemed to be falling into a common center, as if the dirt below was being removed. As I watched, suddenly I was horrified to see a long, skinny, human arm emerge from the ground. It disappeared, drawing back some of the earth with it. There was a movement of dirt over a larger area, and the arm reappeared, together with a man's head and shoulders. He pulled himself up out of the very ground, as it seemed, shook the dirt from his body like a huge gaunt dog, and stood erect. I never want to see such another creature. Hardly a strip of clothing was visible and what little there was, was so torn and dirty that it was impossible to tell what kind it had been. The skin was drawn tightly over the bones, and there was a vacant stare in the protruding eyes. It looked like a corpse that had lain in a grave a long time. This apparition looked directly at me, and yet did not appear to see me. He looked as if the light bothered him. I spoke, and a look of fear came over his face. He seemed filled with terror. I stepped toward him, shaking a loose piece of barbed wire which had caught in my puttees. Quick as a flash, he turned and started to run from me. For a second, I was too astonished to move. Then I started to follow him. In a straight line he ran, looking neither right nor left. Directly ahead of him was a deep and wide trench. He was running straight toward it. Suddenly it dawned on me that he did not see it. I called out, but it seemed to terrify him all the more, and with one last lunge he stepped into the trench and fell. I heard his body strike the other side of the trench, and fell with a splat into the water at the bottom. I followed, and looked down into the trench. There he lay, with his head bent back in such a position that I was sure his neck was broken. He was half in and half out of the water, and as I looked at him I could scarcely believe what I had seen. Surely he looked as if he had been dead as long as some of the other corpses scattered over the hillside. I turned and left him as he was. Buried while living, I left him unburied when dead. The end of 
The Grave by Oliver R. Emerson The Hour of Death by Grover Brinkman From Weird Tales, December 1925 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Hour of Death by Grover Brinkman The telephone on Dr. Thorndike's littered desk shrieked a single, jerked-out ring, as if the party on the other end of the line was nervous for a connection to be made. Laying aside his hook, he casually reached for the receiver. Hello, he said. Yes, this is Thorndike speaking. Who did you say? Blake. Oh, yes, I recognize your voice now, old man. Didn't at first. It seemed so strained and unnatural. Yes, if you say it's urgent, I'll be over right away. Thorndyke hung up the receiver, donned his hat and coat, and went out the front way of his bachelor apartment, telling his servant that he need not stay up. A minute later he was speeding down the deserted street in his own roadster. Now I wonder what the dickens is the matter, Thorndyke reflected as he sped along, recalling the strained, terrified voice of his old colleague over the wire. He was soon to find out. As he parked his car in Blake's driveway, he had a vague premonition that something was wrong, seriously wrong. A servant met him at the door of Blake's residence, an old, slightly bent man who led him without prelude to Blake's den, where his friend lived alone. But what a different Blake! In the strained, horror-filled face, Thorndyke could hardly recognize the man who, from youth and college days, he always called his closest friend. Blake was a strong man, both mentally and physically. His only weakness, a belief in superstition, and as Thorndyke looked at the mere phantom of the former football star, the frown deepened in his brow. Thank God! I'm glad you came, said Blake unnaturally. It was so late when I called up that I was afraid you might have retired. No, I most always stay up until after midnight reading. But you look as if you've seen a ghost. What in the world is wrong? For answer, Blake pointed to the library table in the center of the room, on which was scattered a pile of letters. He seemed stupefied. His eyes were glassy and wandering. Read one of those, he said queerly and don't take it as a joke for the last six weeks one of those letters has been coming at one o'clock in the morning every time thorndyke his face incredulous picked up the foremost letter and unfolded the single sheet it contained as he read the blood slowly left his face and laughing queerly he read for the second time the brief note Mr. James Blake, two more nights from tonight, at exactly one o'clock, your life will be snuffed out like the breaking of a thread. There was no signature, nothing at all, nothing but the sinister message, without a clue of any kind. Blake gave a hollow laugh. What do you make of it? he asked slowly, hopelessly. Thorndyke shook his head. Then presently his face broke into the image of a smile. No doubt some of your friends trying to put a scare into you, he said, though his voice lacked conviction. I've thought of that. At first I almost believed it, but I don't any more. Why, man, look! More than forty of them! Every night for forty nights at exactly one o'clock! Thorndyke was looking through the letters, trying to conjure some vague reason for their being there. "'Can't you get a clue from the postmarks?' he asked presently. "'No use in trying,' Blake returned. "'Each is mailed within the city, though 
not always at the same station, and each has a special delivery stamp attached. We can't find any clues that way. Suddenly, as Thorndyke started to speak, the tall clock in the hallway chimed out the hour. One o'clock. With the sound, Blake seemed to pale even more, until his face was the color of dead ashes. He slumped down in his chair, trembling in every limb, his eyes in a fixed stare on the doorway. Thorndyke realized with a pang of regret that the sinister letters were proving too much for his old friend. Blake was a wreck, physically and mentally, and to all indications on the verge of losing his mind. "'Buck up, old man,' he said solicitously. "'But my God, Jim!' almost shrieked Blake, his outward calm suddenly deserting him. "'Place yourself in my position. For more than forty nights I have stayed up and waited, waited, for this. I can't sleep. All day and all night this thing haunts me like a bad dream. My mind is about ready to snap. Thank God it's almost over. Either we will find out who's doing this tomorrow night, or I... He broke off abruptly. At that moment, the aged servant noiselessly opened the door, and without further ceremony, handed Blake a letter. Special delivery letter for you, sir, he said obediently, his face an impassive mask, and turned for the door. Blake turned the letter over in his hands like a man in a daze. Without opening it, he handed it to Thorndyke. You read it, he requested, and buried his face in his hands. Thorndyke took it without a word of protest and tore it open. This time the message was even more brief. Twenty-four more hours, and then the breaking of the thread. As he put the letter on the table, the expression of Thorndyke's face suddenly changed. His countenance hardened. His lips drew into a thin line that barely showed the whiteness of his teeth, and his eyes seemed to be visioning something far away. Blake, he said determinedly, we're going to find out who is doing this, and don't think about tomorrow night. Have you any idea what the motive of sending these crazy letters could be? No, I haven't, said Blake hopelessly. I'm pretty well provided for financially, but not rich. It's not a scheme to blackmail me for money, I'm sure of that. And I don't know of any enemies here in New York. How about your servant? suddenly asked Thorndyke. Blake laughed. Nothing suspicious about him. I've had him for ten years. He thinks the letters are from my factory superintendent out of town. A daily report of the work. All right, said Thorndyke. I suppose in that case you can trust him. I think I'll be going now. There's nothing to be gained by your sitting up and racking your brains about it. You go to bed and sleep, and forget all about this. I'll come tomorrow night, before one o'clock, and we'll see what happens. Leaving a sleeping potion, he left, advising the old servant to see that Blake had every care. All that day Thorndyke thought about the coming night. Toward evening he had a visitor in the form of Inspector Carson, who, though ten years his senior, was one of his closest friends and always an intimate friend of Blake. Acting on impulse, he told Carson all about the threats Blake had received, his condition, and asked him to go along that night. Carson accepted, and he promised to call for him at midnight. At eleven o'clock that night, Thorndyke had a call. One of his convalescing suburban patients had grown suddenly worse. They asked him, to come immediately. After telephoning Carson, telling him he might be a few minutes late, Thorndyke left without delay. Although he worked with all possible haste over his patient, and left the sick room as soon as he dared, it was fifteen minutes to one when he drew up in front of Carson's apartment. We'll have to hurry, he said nervously as Carson took the seat beside him. 
I'm sure the letters and threats are fake, but nevertheless I'd like to be there a minute before one o'clock. Blake's the next thing to being insane now, and you can't tell what some little scare might do. It was only a few minutes later that they slowed up for Blake's residence. As they turned into the dark driveway that wound serpent-like to the house, situated far back from the street, Carson suddenly gave a warning cry as a fleeing figure jumped directly into the path of the car. Thorndyke jammed on the brakes, but it was too late to avoid striking the man. With a sickening sensation in the pit of his stomach, he climbed out of the machine. Carson was already bending over the prostrate form, and it was with a profound shock that he recognized the bent form as that of Blake's servant. It was obvious that the man's condition was critical, though he still remained conscious, and as he bent over him, Thorndyke saw the pale lips move as if he wanted to speak. A sip of brandy from his first aid kit seemed to revive him for a moment, and he began to talk. Listen, he began brokenly, just above a whisper, I'm about gone, so it'll be just as well if I tell you something. He stopped a moment, as if gathering strength to go on. Then, I was the one who wrote those letters to Blake. I wanted to make him suffer. Years ago, Blake was the cause of my daughter's disgrace. I promised her I would make him pay, and I did. He's been in hell for the last six weeks. I never intended to kill him. Wanted to make him suffer. Better go up to the house. The voice ceased. The aged servant lapsed into unconsciousness. Shuddering slightly, Thorndyke gently lay back the tousled head, and with Carson at his side, started for the house. As he pushed open the front door, the clock in the hallway struck the hour, one o'clock. The deep chime seemed to send an icy shiver through his body, and he saw that Carson was pale also. With the chime, also, was a sound that he could not fathom, something like a low, deep moan. The next moment he pushed open the library door, Carson at his back. Thorndyke gave a gasp at what he saw, and he felt the blood suddenly chill in his veins. Blake was crumpled in a heap on the floor, where he had fallen face forward out of his chair. Springing forward, Thorndyke quickly felt the stricken man's pulse, then placed his ear over his heart. The next moment he looked up, with a tragic face, to encounter the troubled gaze of Carson. "'We were a minute too late,' said Thorndyke slowly, brokenly. "'He's dead. Died of fright.' The End of The Hour of Death by Grover Brinkman The House of Fear by Albert Seymour Graham From Weird Tales, March 1925 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The House of Fear by Albert Seymour Graham a house of silence, broken at times by a weird wailing, as from the pit. A house of dreams, gray in the moonlight, under the leprous silvery fingers of the moon. Brooding now, a grim gray fortress of the accused, the stronghold of the beast. Dance pines grew about it and when the wind wailed among them, it met and mingled with an eerie ululation rising as if muffled by many thicknesses of walls, to end with a quick shriek and a sudden hush, broken after a moment by the faint echo of a taunting laugh. 
that laughter would have struck terror through the swart soul of the Luevi, if the Luevi have souls. For it is like the eldritch howl, faint and thin, like the thin, tinkling laughter of a fiend, without pity and without ruth. Here, in the sanatorium of Dr. Helmholtz, there were secrets within secrets, walls within walls, downward as in Dante's seven Hades, and from this monastery of hopelessness there penetrated, on occasion, outward from its battlement walls, wild, frantic laughter. But there was nothing demonic about it, because it was the laughter of the insane. But then other laughter, like the sound heard in dreams, passers-by, as if there were any such, hearing it, would shudder and pass on. For the secret of that house of doom was terrible and grim, a secret for him who might have guessed at it, to be whispered behind locked doors and with bated breath. And there had been those who had whispered of the lost souls within those walls, and the whisper ran that they were, indeed, madmen who had not been always mad, but had become maniacs after their commitment to the bleak house within the wood. In a bare cell, six feet by six, a cubicle in which there was barely sufficient headroom for a tall man to stand upright, a figure stood with its hands clenched upon the bars, staring outward at the grim wood visible to the south. Carold Baker, banker, had abode here, in this living tomb, three weeks, say rather, three centuries, in which, as in a nightmare of old horror, he had been aware merely of a face, three-pointed, bearded, and eyes active with a malign intelligence, the lips smiling always with the cold smile of death. Twice a day the small panel in his cell door had slid backwards without sound to frame, in the opening, the face of Dr. Helmholtz, like a face without a body and without a soul. Carold Baron, banker, knew that it was not a dream that would pass, because on the second day the head had spoken. Baron was scarcely a coward. He had fought like a baited grizzly when surprised in his house by the men who had brought him, under cover of night, to this prison house. Now, at the voice, like the slow drip of an acid, Baron stared straight before him with the gaze of a man who has abandoned hope. "'My dear Mr. Baron,' the voice had whispered, "'the little matter of that check, if you please. You will make it out to cash. Ah, that is good. I perceive you are wise.' It had not been the pistol in the lean, claw-like hand nor even the eyes, brooding upon him with the impersonal, cold stare of a cobra. Carol Barron might have refused it had not been for the sounds that he had heard, and the sights that he had seen when taken at midnight from his cubicle. He had beheld the administration of the cone. And like Macbeth, with that one sight, and the sight of that which came after, he had supped full of horrors until now, at the bidding of that toneless voice he had obeyed. Three times thereafter, at the command of his dark jailer, he had paid tribute, nor had he been of all that lost battalion the single victim, for there had been others. Now, separated from him scarce a dozen feet a girl with golden hair sat huddled 
eyes in the sightless staring upon the stone floor of her cell. Like Baron, she had not been mercifully killed. She had been saved for a fate unspeakable, beside which death would be a little thing. So far, she had been treated decently enough. Her cell was wide and airy, plainly but comfortably furnished. But as to the look of the grey-green eyes of the master of black magic, she was not so sure. There came a sudden movement in the corridor without, a panting, a sniffing, a quick pad-pad of marching feet. The girl, her eye to the keyhole of the door, could see but dimly. She made out merely the sheeted figures, like grim gliding ghosts, and a rigid figure, on the stretcher, moving silently on its rubber-tired wheels. Then, at an odor stealing inward through the keyhole, she recoiled. That perfume had been sickish sweet, overpowering, dense, and yet sharp, with a faint acrid sweetness, the odor of ether. And then, although she could not see it, a man in the next cell had risen, white-faced, from his cot, to sink back limply as the dark hand holding that inverted cone had swept downward to his face. Harold Barron sprang to his feet as the narrow door swung open to press backward against the window bars as the high priest of horror, followed by his familiars, cowled and hooded, entered with a slow, silent step. The doctor spoke, and his voice was like a chill wind. My friend, I bring you forgetfulness, a brief breath of hours, and then, ah, then, you will be a new man, a man reborn, my friend. Now. Baron, his face gray with a sort of hideous strain, stared silently, white-lipped, as, at a low-voiced order, the attendants came forward. The lean hand reached forward. It poised, darted, swooped, and in it was the cone. A choked gurgle, a strangled, sharp cry, penetrating outward in a vague shadow of clamor, and then silence with the faint whisper of the wind among the pines, the brule of rushing river, the faint, half-audible footfalls passing and repassing in that corridor of the dead. Once, and it was never repeated, a man came there from the capital. He had demanded to see the doctor's patients. And as the investigator stood there, viewing with a faint, creeping horror the nondescripts paraded before him, gibbering, mouthing in an inarticulate, furious babble. A man had burst suddenly from the line with the strangled cry. Frank, don't you know me? I'm Baron Carrold. The voice was the voice of Baron, but the face, it was the face of another, totally unlike there had been no possible resemblance. But the man had been sane. The investigator was persuaded of that. He was suffering under a peculiar delusion indeed, but sane. The man rushed forward, bearing his arm, and there, on that thin, pitiful flesh, which had once been healthy and hard, there ran a curious design in red. The investigator sucked in his breath as that tell-tale birthmark sprang livid under his gaze, for he had seen it before. The doctor's eyes narrowed to slits. Somehow the man from the capital gained the impression 
that it was the first time he had seen that mark. But the investigator could do nothing. Birthmarks can be duplicated. He waited then in curious indecision as the bearded doctor interposed suavely. Well, of course, Commissioner, you're quite aware, or you should be, how it is. These paranoics are noted for their delusions. They believe themselves to be someone else, and always a bank president, say, or a famous actor, an author, a great general. Now, Mr. Barron, you know him, I believe? Beneath the silken tone there ran suddenly a hint of iron, of menace, veiled but actual. The investigator felt it. This patient knew your name, of course, the suave voice continued. Poor fellow, we must be gentle with him. And there the matter ended. Curiously enough, the man who had claimed to be Banker Baron had, after that first burst of frenzied speech, kept silent. Perhaps that mordant gleaming in the doctor's eyes had telegraphed a warning, a message, a command. Nevertheless, the investigator, still dissatisfied, took another walk through the corridors, and determined to find the thing that seemed to be wrong. Corridor after corridor he traversed, and found nothing amiss. But while going through a last corridor, he saw a woman standing before a mirror, gazing into the face that appeared to her, and laughing, laughing, laughing. But there was no mirth in that laugh. When the investigator returned, he looked at his own features in a glass with the memory of that hideous laugh still ringing in his ears. He fancied suddenly beholding another's face where his own should be, and wondered, wondered whether that shock would not deprive him of his reason. For the woman he had seen, staring at her reflection in the glass, had had golden hair, pretty hands, and an adorable figure, but her face had been the rough, unshaven face of a man. But nothing could be done. The woman might have been born with the features of a man, but the investigator doubted it. Nevertheless, personal opinions have no influence over law, and law sometimes upholds crimes that have never been brought to account. The investigator went home, oddly shaken, to dream of a white face with staring eyes, which changed, even as he gazed, into the face of his long-lost friend, Carol Barron, to hear even in his dreams a voice, and it was the voice of the living and the dead. The End of the House of Fear by Albert Seymour Graham The Jungle Presence by Dick Hine From Black Mask Magazine, February 1925 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org read by Dale Grothman. The Jungle Presence by Dick Hine I believe that if I had been less fatigued mentally and physically, I should have escaped in some degree the agony of that terrible night, the night that shall never be forgotten while I linger in the flesh. The Burman sun had finished its scorching course of the day, and was sinking behind a dust and haze horizon painting the sky and leaving very little breeze to cool the tired men and beasts whose day was done. The quiet of the evening fell upon me as I walked toward my bungalow through the lanes of thirsty green. 
I had worked hard that day. The company's warehouse man would have his hands full to handle the large number of boxes I had shipped. I rested outside half an hour before going in for a bath and clean white clothes. Then, refreshed and cool, I ate the light supper my Chinese boy, Loon Ku, had prepared for me. The moon had risen when I went to the veranda to sit and smoke. I propped my feet up and faced the wide grove and lawn. The jagged edge of a large palm leaf hung over the face of the moon, cutting the yellow disk into triangles. I sat quietly for an hour and enjoyed pipe after pipe. As I was thinking of retiring, I felt a hot breeze coming from the grove. The air was hot, oppressive beyond anything I had ever experienced at evening. At once I became uneasy. The nicotine had made me restless, and a sinking, apprehensive feeling came over me. Then came the hint of the presence, the evil presence. The realization that I was being watched filled me with horrid dread. The thought of impending danger, an indescribable something about me that sought to do me hurt, made my heart quake with fear. A man shaking, sickened, terrorized with fear. The very shame of it cut me to the quick. I leapt to my feet and dashed into the house. My forehead was wet with sweat and my cheeks were pale. I drank some liquor and paced the room. After three quarters of an hour, I managed to brace up my nerves a little. I would not yield to the evil will of the presence without. And so, determined that I would not be driven from my own veranda by an imaginary danger, I returned to the porch and stood by the roof post. The hot wave still prevailed and I felt my nervousness returning. Then, as I looked into the moonlit grove, I heard a sigh very near me, but in front, behind, or where, I could not tell, only near. A moment later there came to my nostrils a peculiar smell, a foul scent from the far-hung tangles of rotting vegetation. I stood still and thought I saw in the air before my face two little green sparks of light shining with a brilliance of polished diamonds. My strength came. I had seen something material and feared no longer. The sweat cooled. I passed my hands before my face, and the lights were gone. I felt that I had met and conquered a foe, half material and, perhaps, half illusion. I could retire and sleep in peace. Loon Koo slept in the rear of the bungalow and had gone to bed when I went in the second time. My room was in front with a window opening to the porch. I found the room cooler with the windows closed as it barred the hot breeze. For fifteen minutes I deliberated with myself about the needle. I ended by using it. I shot it home pitilessly and my pierced muscle quivered under the thrust. There were many little marks on my arms. I felt ashamed, but the sleep, the restful oblivion, could anything be sweeter? Before the drug had begun to work, I fastened the room up tight and lay down. It was close, of course, but why should I mind that? I should sleep. My breath came deep and long. Falling through space, weightless and devoid of reason a million miles that's not far to fall ten times a million miles i fell i fell the stars and planets but sparks of light and i myself only a small golden pinhead what is myself the river was deep the grass was green i am taller than he is his mouth is funny his eyes are green. They are diamonds. What makes him move his head so? He wheezes. He sighs. That's old Mother Hubbard. That spider works 
sand, salt, water, blue, rainbow colors. What? Senseless and falling through space. What is space? It all happened in a fraction of a second. Crazy nothings. Distractions of a tortured brain. Was I dreaming? Am I dreaming? Am I dreaming? Something seems awfully heavy, hot, oppressive, magnetic. It's not heavy near my face. It has no weight on my face. But down on my legs the weight is terrible. What makes it so heavy? The coverings are not pulled over me. Spending months in a moment, decades in a second, I broke the spell and became conscious. This state constituted only a few perceptions. My eyes were closed. I was myself, resting where I always rested, in space, for I am space, the beginning and the ending of space. I was somewhere. There was an evil presence, the hot presence. There hovered over me the hint of danger, not now, but impending. If I knew what the danger was, I might resist. The weight of the hint bore down upon my upper body, a spiritual weight with a crushing force. The heavy, material weight on my abdomen and legs was nothing compared to it. The greater the power of evil, the heavier was its atmosphere. I had thought that this idea of crushing weight had been part of the dream, but consciousness proved it to be real. I began to be more aware of my body. My hands were folded across my chest and suffered from the pressure. My eyes would not open. There seemed to be a power above me that kept them closed, and I did not want to open them. I felt that when they did open, I felt that when they did open, I would lose the poise of my high-strung nerves. The sweat steeped from my skin. My forehead felt as if the most powerful magnet in existence were trying to draw out my brains. If I opened my eyes, the magnet would get in its work. Then it occurred to me that perhaps I had seemingly died, been buried alive, come to life again and that the heaviness torturing me was the foul air of the coffin. I had no record of time. Suddenly I felt the veil of weight beginning to lift. My eyelids twitched. They would open. Unable to resist, I opened my eyes wide. Apparently I was in my room. The moonlight came in wan swords through the slits in the blinds. There was barely enough light to make objects perceptible. I heard a faint sigh, though somewhat louder than the one I had heard on the veranda. Then there came the jungle odor, that putrid breath from distant wilds. Turning my eyes upward, I perceived the cause of my terror. There, with its expanded neck and devilish head poised in a curve within six inches of my face, its eyes staring straight into the depths of mine, its body coiled on my lower limbs, was the horror of creation, the giant cobra de capello. Somehow a strange calm came over me, and I looked away from the snake. Then I closed my eyes and accepted darkness and death. It seemed that I waited hours for the blow. If I made a movement, perhaps it would come. I decided to end the agony by moving. Just as I felt the muscles respond for the movement of my legs, I changed my mind, what little reason I had left. I would try thought. I thought of Ku. If he were asleep, I could not wake him by sound, but perhaps I could by thought. I turned on the full current. Ku. 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 Coo, coo. A hundred times I thought his name and blessed his yellow skin. After what seemed an interminable period, I heard a light footfall somewhere. I opened my eyes. A silent flash streamed toward me from the other side of the room near the hall door. 
the snake lifted its coils from my lower limbs, its oppressive magnetism from my upper body, and with a mighty leap collected its length in a writhing mass upon the bedroom floor. Ku had risked my life by piercing the snake's head with a silencer bullet, just a fraction of a second before it was to have struck. The leap from the bed was aided by the tense muscles prepared for the blow at me. I sprang from the bed and switched on the light. Loon Ku stood with pistol trained on the now harmless head, and the reptile's reflex action thrashed its tail about the floor. How did you know, Ku? I asked. Hot breeze died down, night cool off. Me feel em dwarf and wakey. Hear something in hall. See slaky. Hunt long time for gun, then shoot. And Ku smiled, calm and collected, as is ever his kind. I looked into the mirror to attest the agony I had suffered. I saw that my eyebrows stood straight out from the skin, and my forehead was speckled with little beads of sweated blood. The End of The Jungle Presence by Dick Hine The Triple Murder in Mulberry Bend by Christopher Hawthorne. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Triple Murder in Mulberry Bend. You will find three dead men in Mulspini's cellar in Mulberry Bend. The single typewritten line was undated and unsigned, but on the lower right-hand corner of the paper were three distinct fingerprints, made with such precision that, obviously, they were placed there with a purpose. Silent Cass, lieutenant of detectives, read the note without visible excitement or interest. "'Looks like the real thing,' he grunted, tossing it across the desk. "'What do you think, Gaddy?' Sergeant Gaddy glanced stolidly at the writing, arose slowly, and put on his hat. Cass also stood up, shifting a small automatic from his hip to an outside coat pocket. Let's walk, he said. Mulberry Bend was only ten minutes from headquarters. Anonymous letters belonged to the routine, but they rarely yielded anything worthwhile. Sometimes they came from revengeful crooks, bent on getting even. Often they were of the poison pen variety, written out of sheer malice, and more frequently they could readily be identified as the fulminations of half-cracked persons moved by morbid obsessions. But this letter, which had been left at the outside rail at headquarters, addressed to the police, did not fall within any of these categories. Not that it appealed to a train sick sense or any such nonsense. The simple fact was that Mike Mulspini's place was known to both men. In the shadowy past, when as lusty young cops on the Lower East Side they had pounded the pave together, it had been the resort of such picturesque criminals as the wolf and the ox, and had achieved a malodorous celebrity as the scene of a barrel murder. Latterly, however, its evil repute had waned, and Mulspini was conducting the place as a provision shop falling in line with the growing respectability of the quarter. As the detectives turned into the bend from Center Street, a policeman placidly saluted them with one hand while he jingled a handful of coins in the other. "'Anything doing, O'Hare?' asked Cass. "'Bunch of crapshooters took it on the run when they saw me coming,' chuckled the uniformed man, exhibiting the spoils. Sergeant Gaddy looked appraisingly into the open palm. "'Hardly the price of a drink these days,' he sighed. Get busy, thrust in Cass curtly. O'Hara, you just mope along behind us and keep an eye on Mulspini's place while we go inside. A bronzed, sturdy man of about thirty, with a suggestion of the military in his garb and carriage, sauntered past them, halting for an instant as the lieutenant spoke. Mulspini was standing in the door of his shop. He greeted the detectives with an over-cordial grin. What you got in the cellar, Mike? Cass asked the question casually. Not a drop, chief, not a drop. The revenue men got me a month ago with ten gallons of claret. I was let off with a fine, but the next time, whew. Cass and Gaddy laughed with him. 
the revenue men enjoyed no great popularity with the local detectives. "'You don't mind if we go downstairs and look, do you?' asked Cass good-naturedly. "'Hell no. Come right in.' As the detectives followed Mulspeeny into the store, O'Hara slouched past the front door, his eyes roving over the cinder-covered playground that lay directly in front of the bend. Any show of interest in the shop would have collected a crowd in no time. If there is anything that a good policeman hates, it is an assemblage of curious citizens, mixed with the inevitable small boys and peering old ladies, whom one cannot very well wallop with a nightstick. The bronzed young man who overheard the lieutenant's orders to the patrolman had crossed the street and was standing at the curb directly opposite the shop. As O'Hara eyed him, the man drew the makins from a pocket, rolled a cigarette, and walked lazily away in the direction of Worth Street. With carefree alacrity, Mulspeeny led the detectives into the rear room and lifted a trap door. A faint flood of light came up from the cellar. Must have left that lamp burning all night, muttered the shopkeeper fretfully, as though estimating the cost of his carelessness. Silent Cass walked halfway down the steps. Gaddy started to follow, but his superior jerked a thumb over his shoulder, and the sergeant remained upstairs. If you find any booze down there, save a drink for me called Mulspeeny jocularly, as Cass reached the bottom of the stairs. The detective looked around the dimly lit cellar, a vault-like chamber of masonry extending the full length and width of the building. Two small windows, closed now, afforded the only means of ventilation. The place was stuffy to a point of suffocation. The rear half was filled with provision cases and the usual litter of a grocery storeroom. In a clear space well forward, Three men were seated at a large round table, over which hung a single dust-covered electric lamp. Tip's half true, anyway, muttered the detective whimsically. The three men are here, all right, but they're not dead. Kicking over an empty egg crate, he yelled, Hey, you fellows, stir your stumps. What are you doing here? The men at the table did not move or utter a sound. Silent Cass walked over and jarred roughly against the one nearest him. The man rolled from the chair, fell to his back, and remained motionless, one arm covering his face with a grotesque crook. The detective reached down and grasped the upturned wrist. It felt like a piece of damp rubber hose. He released it quickly, and the arm oscillated stiffly without alteration of its original position. Dead. The word followed in the wake of the detective's surprised whistle. The two men remaining at the table showed no interest. Cass gripped his automatic and glared at them, jerking the hat off the second man. The head swayed slightly and a wavering glint came from the staring, opalescent eyes. Dead. This time the word was uttered in a tense staccato. An echo seemed to come from the dim recesses in the rear. Silent Cass wheeled and backed slowly against the masonry, his eyes darting about the cellar. The third man was seated in the most natural position possible. His chin rested within his hands, and he seemed to be asleep. Cass moved toward him cautiously, and with the broad side of his left arm swept the hands from under the chin. The man lurched forward, his head striking the table with a bang. A couple of playing cards fluttered from under him and fell to the floor face up. Dead! The three of them! Cass glanced down at the cards. Buried aces, eh? Gun or knife play, I suppose. Again, Mulspeeny's laugh sounded through the open hatch. The detective wheeled in sudden wrath. Hey, Gaddy, he shouted. Truss that fellow up and throw him under the pool table. A swift scuffle, a snarl, and a thud, as from the impact of a billy on a skull, came to the ears of the listener below. Then a bleeding protest from Mulspeeny. Don't, Sergeant, don't. I'll be quiet. Cass heard the snap of handcuffs and a heavy sound, as though a sack of potatoes had been tossed to the floor. A moment later, Gaddy's head appeared at the top of the stairs. "'What's up, Chief?' he asked eagerly. "'Lock the door and fetch the wop down,' answered Cass. Somewhere in the back of his head lurked the thought that the presence of the three men in the cellar would be a surprise to Mulspeeny. "'Spanish Joe and Louis the lawyer,' he muttered, gazing into the faces of two of the dead men. He was about to lift the head of the third when Mulspeeny stepped gingerly down the steps, followed by Gaddy. The shopkeeper gazed in stupid bewilderment at the three inanimate figures. Cass watched him keenly. If the man was acting, he certainly was a master of dissimulation. Lifting his manacled hands above his head, he yelled, 
Arrest those guys. They ain't got no business in my place. He had started toward the table when Gaddy seized him and threw him back into a pile of crates under the steps. Stay there till your number's called, snarled the sergeant, leaping toward the table. Like his superior, he instantly recognized the two whose faces were revealed. There must have been a hell of a time in hell when those birds flew in, he said grimly. Silent Cass laid his hands on the third man's shoulders. As he drew back the head, the light, reflected from the oilcloth on the table, cast a ghastly green shadow across his face. Both men looked long and earnestly at the rigid features. I don't get that bird, do you? said Gaddy finally. Cass shook his head and beckoned to Molspini. The shopkeeper sprang to his feet and ran to the table. For a single instant, his frightened eyes rested upon the dead face of the man at the table. A shriek, womanish in its intensity and shrillness, broke from him. He strained vainly for a moment at the irons, then, with incoherent gibberings, slithered around the table and kissed the dead man's forehead. A look of loathing passed between the detectives. Neither made any effort to sustain the man as he swayed for a moment and then crashed to the floor without uttering a word. Cass drew the anonymous note from his pocket, gazed at the fingerprints, and then at Gaddy. The sergeant seized the right hand of the man on the floor and examined the index finger. A faint smudge appeared upon it. Similar smudges were discernible on the corresponding fingers of the other two. Sign their own death warrants, surmised Gaddy. Silent Cass shook his head. Sealed him after death, more likely, he said. The person who left the note at headquarters probably did the job. The lieutenant had taken the pendant lamp from the hook, uncoiled the loops, and was holding the light close to the face of Spanish Joe. The countenance wore a look such as might be possible to one which in life bore the marks of all the evil passions. The black, patent leathery hair was banked smoothly down over the forehead. The clothing was undisturbed, and the whole attitude of the body that of some poisonous thing suddenly bereft of life by being sealed in a vacuum. In whatever guise death had come to him, it had borne no message of terror to Spanish Joe. With deft fingers, Gaddy ran over the upper part of the body and under the clothing. There was no sign of blood. From a secret pocket in the vest under the left armpit, he drew a poniard. It glinted in the light as he held it up. Clean as a hound's tooth, said Cass. Gaddy turned to examine the other two. The search revealed no outward sign of physical violence. Nothing, in fact, but the usual pocket miscellany. A billfold taken from the body of Louis the lawyer contained nearly $500. Nothing unusual, as Louis's wealth was a matter of common knowledge on the Lower East Side, if the source thereof was not. Silent Cass stooped and moved the lamp slowly along the floor. Gaddy, with face close to the cement, followed the light until he came to the cards. Buried aces, explained Cass. They fell out from under one of these fellows when I shook them. Well, this didn't happen in a crooked game, said Gaddy sagely. Not if the cards were still buried when he died. He picked up a broken Chianti flask near the table. Fah! He sputtered, thrusting it out at arm's length. Whatever was in that bottle had an awful kick to it. Cass also thrust his nose into the broken flask, then set it gingerly down on the table. Kick, he echoed. Why, this bottle seems to be dry inside, yet it's got a kick like a South African jackass. One whiff made me dizzy. Wonder if it's wood alcohol. The detectives were erect now and gazing at Molspini's silent figure, so much like the others, that he, too, seemed dead. Gaddy went to the rear, drew a bucket of water from the spigot, and returning, threw it over the prostrate man's face. Molspini spluttered and sat up. Gaddy dragged him to his feet and faced him toward the dead man, whom the shopkeeper had kissed on the forehead. "'Who is he?' demanded the sergeant. Mospini gave a frightened whimper, but did not answer. "'Who is he?' repeated Gaddy relentlessly, drawing back his billy. Cass thrust out an intervening hand. Man was handcuffed. Besides, the lieutenant well knew the futility of confessions made under duress when a case came to trial. Gaddy dropped the billy back into his coat pocket with a snarling laugh. He'll change his mind after a night in the old slip. We'll give him the best room in the house. Nice, quiet place where nobody can hear him squawk when we throw the boots into him. Cass turned away to conceal a grin from the prisoner. He did not like Gaddy's coarse third-degree work. There were grits in it. Wheeling suddenly upon the shopkeeper, he demanded, 
When did your brother come from Italy, Mike? The long finger of conjecture touched the point. It's my brother Tony, he admitted brokenly. But I don't know these other fellows, or how they came by their death. Tony has a key to the shop. He was a deserter from the other side and had to keep under cover, so I let him use the cellar once in a while for card games with his friends. You lie, snorted Gaddy. Nevertheless, he turned to Cass and said gleefully, We cleared up that point anyway. Did we? There was a sarcastic note in the lieutenant's voice. Take this fellow over to headquarters. Better remove the irons and slip out the back way if you don't want to play drum major in front of an east side procession. Gaddy and Mulspini, both trying to look unconcerned, walked rapidly across the playgrounds toward headquarters, just as three police wagons came clanging into the bend by way of Worth Street. The bronzed young man, who had observed the detectives enter the provision shop, jumped from a bench as the two men passed him. "'What's the matter over there? Pulling a raid?' he asked. "'Beat it,' snapped Gaddy, pushing Mulspini roughly ahead. The young man smiled, but did not resume his seat. Gaddy moved along a few yards, then paused uneasily. "'Wonder if I overlooked a bet in not putting the basket over that guy,' he muttered. "'He's the same fellow who passed us on our way into the shop.' When he turned, however, the bronzed young man had disappeared in the crowd that was flocking toward the police wagons. O'Hara, in the meantime, had relinquished the task of handling the mob to the reserves and resumed his post. The young man, who had been rebuffed by Gaddy, paused at his elbow. The policeman looked into the open, smiling face and relieved his chest of a weight that had been lying there since the meaning of the whole affair began to dawn upon him. "'What chance has a harness bull got in a case like this?' he asked bitterly. "'You might as well hang a red lantern on him and send him out with a fife and drum corps.' The bronzed young man smiled as O'Hara moved disconsolately away. Stone blind, both of them, he chuckled. The right way to escape the cops is to keep on their heels or hide in the grill room of the Waldorf. Little that was new was discovered at headquarters. The fingerprints of Spanish Joe and Louis the lawyer tallied with those in the archives, which also contained the records of both men. There were no prints or history of the third man, whom Mulspini had admitted to be his brother. Spanish Joe's record was such as must have assured him a warm welcome beyond the sticks. Listed as an agent for burlesque shows, he had been twice convicted as a white slaver, and once for felonious assault. It was noteworthy, however, that he had never served a full term in prison. His birthplace was given as Havana, Cuba, and his origin mixed Spanish and Carib Indian. The record and antecedents of Louis the lawyer were hardly more savory. From a shyster practice in Essex Market Court, he had branched out to the dubious distinction of being considered the chief lawyer and go-between in the netherworld. It was his dark and secret operations that were responsible for the immunity from prison that Spanish Joe had so long enjoyed. Although he had a fine home in Riverside Drive, it was in the purlieus of the Lower East Side that he found his true atmosphere, his horizon not having widened apace with his increasing wealth. In that stifling, dirty cellar in Mulberry Bend, the hog had returned to his wallow, and had been smothered in it. One thing was evident from the beginning. The triple murder, if such it was, did not have its origins in a vendetta. All the fantastic earmarks usual to a Southern European feud were absent. There was no hideous marring of the bodies. Indeed, no mark of any kind was found upon them. Nor did the coroner find a trace of poison after the autopsies. A chemical analysis of the organs revealed nothing. The men, apparently, had died of natural causes, and simultaneously. Brooding like three black crows over the sinister mystery, the fingerprints on the mysterious note to the police seemed to afford the only clue. Who had placed them with such care upon the clean white paper? What practiced hand had written the note itself? It was not the work of a bunglesome amateur. The nicety of spacing and general evenness of the work precluded such a conclusion. Silent Cass and Sergeant Gaddy went over the back trails of the three dead men, encountering nothing but blank walls everywhere and emerging from blind alleys with empty hands. From the very first, Cass had been satisfied that Mulspini had told the truth when he came out of his faint in the cellar. Gaddy, though he did not admit it to his superior, had beaten the shopkeeper almost to a pulp, avoiding only bruising of his face without getting any additional information. Nor did the sergeant say a word about his encounter with the bronzed young man in the playground. 
Somehow, through his turgid reasoning, the thought persisted that this smiling, open-faced stranger had not thrust himself into the case by accident. The hope grew in him that some subtle influence would draw this man to the tombs, or perhaps into the courtroom when Mulspini was arraigned. But in this he was disappointed. Although the cooperation of the entire detective and uniformed forces of the city was enlisted, the case, technically, was in the hands of silent Cass. Eager reporters sought him for news of the latest developments. But as one star remarked in his story, Lieutenant Cass continues to have brilliant flashes of silence. Another, in the unharnessed freedom of the editorial rooms, complained gloomily that he could get nothing out of Cass but silence, and damn little of that. In view of all this, it is not strange that the record of the lieutenant should have become an object of curious inquiry. Nothing of outstanding brilliance was found in it. From the day he had joined the force, he had been taciturn to a point of eccentricity. It was his own fellows in the clubhouse under the green lamp who first dubbed him Silent Cass. In the days of the old red light district on the Lower East Side, he had been known as a relentless pursuer of cadets, but he had never shared in the public glory of having cleaned out these worst of human vermin. His private life was found to be equally drab and uninteresting. He owned a little home in the far reaches of the Bronx. His wife was dead, and his daughter, now about 18, kept house for him. All this was water on Gaddy's wheel. While Cass had been silent and colorless, the sergeant had always been garrulous and spectacular. Now he was playing true to form. Hardly a day passed without some new development from this energetic and ambitious officer. He combed the underworld for suspects and dragged bloodied and disheveled prisoners into headquarters for the lineup. He was always on the eve of an important arrest. The commissioner looked with tolerant, if skeptical, eye upon these activities and with growing impatience at the lieutenant's failure to produce results. In the midst of all this, a reporter journeyed to the Bronx with the dimly burning hope that he might be able to smoke Cass out right in his own home. He found the lieutenant in overalls spading the garden and young Miss Cass pruning the vines around the porch. An ironic description of this bucolic scene was duly printed the next morning, coupled with the news of another important arrest by Sergeant Gaddy. Then things began to happen around headquarters. In a special order by the commissioner, Lieutenant Cass was reduced to the rank of patrolman and assigned to duty in the Bronx with a post at the zoological park. This play to the gallery met with instant applause. One smart paragrapher remarked, that Cass would find congenial companionship among his simian brethren in the zoo. A few days later, the promotion of Sergeant Gaddy to the rank of lieutenant was announced. Mulspini and a few other mysterious prisoners were transferred to the detention house as material witnesses, and the triple murder in Mulberry Bend began to wear down in public interest. Cass accepted his reduction without protest. The day he had been caught in the garden was the first one he had taken off in a month, but he did not urge the point. Instead, he left his measure for a new uniform and soon was pounding the pavement around the buffalo entrance of the zoo. The larger measure of leisure he enjoyed in his humbler task was spent in the garden with his daughter. So things went on for another week. One morning, when Silent Cass was putting down his radishes, a bronzed young man swung from the rear platform of a trolley car directly in front of the house and walked briskly over to the fence. Cass looked up and nodded pleasantly. Is this Lieutenant Cass? asked the stranger abruptly. Patrolman Cass, corrected the gardener. I want to give myself up, said the stranger. Cass made a trench with his stick and sowed a handful of seed. Come in, he said, standing erect and looking squarely at the newcomer. What have you been up to? I'm the man who killed those three rats in Mulberry Bend, explained the bronzed young man coolly. Cass bent down on one knee, made another shallow little trench, and sprinkled it with seed. Oh, yeah, the Mulberry Bend case, he said reflectively. I've been expecting you. Turning to his daughter, he continued, You don't mind leaving us alone for a few minutes, do you, Nellie? The girl smiled at the stranger and walked to the porch. The policeman nodded toward a bench under a magnolia that was just bursting into blossom. Tell me about it, he said as the two were seated. If the newcomer found anything strange in this reception, he made no sign. I read in the papers that you have been broken for not finding the murderer, he said quietly, and I've been off my feet and sleep since then. I couldn't stand it any longer. I want you to lock me up. 
Silent Cass glanced at him swiftly. The newcomer spoke up quickly. No, the ghosts of the dead men were not roosting on my pillow. Damn them. They were not the kind that come back to haunt honest men. Although, they seem to have done it to you. That is, in a way. Cass nodded. I knew them. They're snug at home in hell. He looked toward the porch, and Nellie smiled back at him. I'm a serviceman myself, resumed the stranger. Medical corps. I was on the other side for two years, and it was during that time these three dogs earned their death over here. The record of Spanish Louis, the white slaver, flashed through the mind of the listener. Girl? he queried casually. Yes, a girl. The word snapped brokenly from the stranger's lips. It was the first sign of emotion that he had shown. Sweetheart, I suppose, murmured Cass pityingly. The young man's face had dropped into his hands and he was shaking violently. Worse than that, he groaned, a sister. Cass looked again toward the porch and laid his hand gently on the man's shoulder. Go on, he said. The tale came out in a torrent of anguished, broken words. The girl was an only sister, and both had been orphaned since childhood. Out of his earnings as a chemist, he had been able to support and educate her until he entered the service and went abroad. She was pretty, had a sweet soprano voice and a turn for the stage. She had smothered his misgivings with the assurance that she was able to care for herself, and so they parted. After he had been in France six months, her letters, always regular theretofore, ceased abruptly. Again, Cass's mind reverted to Spanish Joe. The man on the bench had grown calm. A gentle breeze swept through the tree overhead, and a few blossoms fluttered downward. If she had only died before it happened, he said, gazing at the broken petals. Cass patted him on the shoulder, and he resumed. It was a long time after I came back before I was able to trace her. It was down in New Orleans, in a place that was worse than the deepest gulf of hell. Her mind and soul were gone, gone completely with whiskey and cocaine, that and... He pressed his hands over his eyes. Dad, called the girl on the porch. It's time for you to go on post. Cass stood up mechanically and pulled off his overalls. Wait here till I get into uniform, he said, walking into the house. He was gone fully five minutes, but when he returned, the young man was still seated on the bench. The policeman dropped to a place beside him with a trace of disappointment in his manner. The young man had not seemed to notice the long absence. I was able to get the story out of her before she finally broke away from me, he continued. Then she ran upstairs and drank poison. It was the only thing left. I brought her back here and buried her beside her mother. There was a postcard picture taken at Coney Island in her trunk. She was sitting in an automobile with Spanish Joe and Tony Mulspini. She was smiling in all the innocence that I had known before I left her. His jaws came together with a snap. It was on that day she got the theatrical engagement with Louis the lawyer, posing as a producer of musical comedy. How did you get him into the cellar, and what did you use to kill them? Asked Cass prosily enough. I paddle around with them for a month and let them win a month's salary from me one night, right down there in that hole. They had it all arranged to trim me again when... He paused, and there was a sudden ferocity in his tone when he burst forth again. The death I gave them was too easy. I was watching across the street when they entered the store together. When I saw a light in the cellar, I knew I had them. It was just a matter of walking in, lifting the trap door, and tossing down the flask of gas. Gas! shouted Cass, jumping to his feet. There was no trace of gas poisoning found in the examination of the organs. It was a formula of my own. The answer came with a touch of pride. I had been working on it in France, but the armistice came before the use of it became necessary. The action is negative, absorbs the oxygen from the air, you know. He chuckled grimly. I simply sealed the three of them up with it. A horned toad, a centipede, and a tarantula, all in one bottle. Why did you make the fingerprints? The question seemed natural enough, but the answer came in a tone of surprise. I wanted to let the authorities know I had done the world a favor. Why not? Cass smiled approvingly and stood up. The bronzed young man also got to his feet. I'm ready, he said. On the way to the gate, he drew an envelope from his pocket and handed it to the policeman. Cass read the contents curiously. Under the caption, Army Orders, appeared a brief paragraph. Captain Franklin Hines, Medical Corps, is hereby relieved from duty at Camp Merritt and transferred to Panama. Silent Cass carefully folded the official order, put it back in the envelope, and handed it to the Army man. Assignment in the Yellow Fever Squad, eh? He remarked. When are you going to sail? Captain Hines stared at him. 
Aren't you going to arrest me? He demanded stupidly. Don't you want to make good and get your old job back? Cass shook his head. Not at that price, he said. His hand was on the gate latch and his eyes roaming down the street toward an approaching trolley car. Wait, father, called Nellie from the porch. She ran down into the garden, plucked a white crocus and pinned it to his coat. Against regulations, he laughed, but I've earned the right to wear it today. In a moment, he had bounded across the pavement and boarded the car, leaving the army man and the girl together. Captain Hines glanced down the street. Another car was coming. Won't you have a flower, too? asked the girl, stooping to pick a red blossom from the garden. Yes, thank you, he said huskily. Won't you give me a white one, the same as you gave to your dad? She fastened a white flower in his coat, and in a moment he was scrambling aboard the second car. As the rear door slammed on him, Gaddy swung off from the front and walked over to the fence. Nellie greeted him familiarly. You just missed Dad, she said. He's gone out on post. Oh, has he? said Gaddy. I just came out here to tell him I got another promotion today. I'm Captain Gaddy now. End of The Triple Murder in Mulberry Bend by Christopher Hawkins Recording by Colleen McMahon The Mystery of Room 16 by Anne Austin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Amy Dunkelberger. The Mystery of Room 16 by Anne Austin. The city editor called me to his desk as he hung up the receiver. Chase over to the Alexandria Hotel. Jenks has just phoned from police headquarters that a young chap name of Anson, Jerry Anson, died of cyanide poisoning in front of an elevator a few minutes ago. Jenks will cover the police angle, but there seems to be a woman connected to the case. She's disappeared, he says, and I'd like a woman's angle on the whole thing. How's Detective Flournoy is a friend of ours. He'll give you the dope as he works on the case. As the city editor talked, he did not look up, but continued to run through copy and clippings on his desk. It was that hectic hour, two o'clock, and ours was an afternoon sheet. I would have to move fast if I got anything into the final edition. A murder or a suicide in the fashionable and high-priced Alexandria Hotel was something of a sensation in itself. The same event occurring in a small hostelry on Hill Street or Main Street would have been looked upon as nothing out of the ordinary, and would hardly have called for the services of a woman feature writer, at least in the early stages of its investigation. I found Flournoy, who was paid to keep notoriety away from the sacred portals of the Alexandria, in a state of profound excitement. The guests were of two minds. They enjoyed the sensation, but pretended a slight feeling of resentment that this thing should have happened where they were stopping. "'Funny business,' said Flournoy, as we stood at the door of room 16, where the suicide or murder victim had played his last earthly drama. "'Ordinarily I would set it down as suicide, but there are aspects of this case that lead me to believe it is murder.' It was one of the Alexandria's more modest rooms, fairly large and well furnished. On one of the twin beds, both of them had been slightly mussed, as by people lounging on them after the chambermaid had done her best, lay the body of a young man. I was fortunate in arriving just when I did, for the body was just about to be removed to the morgue as I entered. The room was nearly full of people, whom the police were having a hard time to control. Any person who touches anything in this room without authority will be immediately placed under arrest, a broad-breasted man in plain clothes was saying when I entered. A group of reporters, policemen, and hotel employees was gathered about a folding table, such as is used for serving meals in guest rooms. The table had been set for two, and evidently two people had eaten a very good luncheon. On the white cloth were scattered the usual silver, plates, cups, and saucers, the silver cover of a meat dish, a water bottle, and two glasses, both of which had been partially emptied. The meal had been so recently finished that the water in the glasses did not look stale. There were no small bubbles collected against the sides of the glasses. I had a good look at the face of the boy before his body was removed. 
He was very young, not more than twenty-two or three, fair-haired, blue-eyed, and thin-cheeked. His rather full mouth was slightly distorted, as if in a death agony. The chin had a deep cleft, which gave the whole face a very childish and pathetic appeal. When the two white-coated attendants from the morgue had withdrawn with the stretcher on which the body lay covered, the sergeant turned to survey the room full of people. Two men from police headquarters stood at his elbow. "'Is the day clerk in the room?' he asked. "'Yes, sir. Tell all you know about the deceased.' "'Well, it's not much.' The day clerk, enjoying the spotlight, smiled deprecatingly. The young man came in this morning about ten o'clock and registered for himself and wife, Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Anson, Oakland, California. He had a large, handsome suitcase with him, and I did not ask him for his room rent in advance. Said he and his wife would be here several days. He was here on business. Also said his wife was out shopping and would come in later in the morning. He told me he would like to have luncheon served in his room later, and I told him he could telephone for a waiter when he wanted one. I saw him buy a paper and a magazine at the newsstand, and then he followed the bellboy up to his room. Did you see him again? Yes. He came down in an hour or so, about eleven o'clock, and left his key at the desk. I asked him if he found everything all right, and he said everything was fine. He said if his wife came in and asked for the key for me to tell her that he would be out only a few minutes. She didn't come, and he seemed a little disturbed. He said to me, jokingly, I suppose I'll have to put a mortgage on the old homestead to pay for all the shopping she's doing. I made some polite remark, and he walked away. I never saw him again, until the waiter, Carney, came running up to the desk to tell me that he was dead. He said, never mind that. We'll let Carney tell his own story. When did Mrs. Anson arrive? She didn't arrive at all, so far as I know. I never left the desk, and no lady came to ask the number of Mr. Anson's room. She may have... Let's not speculate on what she may have done, the sergeant said sharply. Is a telephone operator in the room? Yes, sir, said a girl's voice. I was on the board from ten o'clock to one when I was relieved so I could eat. Your name? Miss Parsons, sir. The girl flung back her head defiantly, her childhood fear of the police strong upon her. Did you put through any telephone calls for Mr. Anson, either incoming or outgoing? Only one. He called for a waiter, and I connected him with the restaurant. He didn't call any outside number, and no one called him. Is the waiter here? The sergeant called peremptorily. A shuffling, meek-looking man, past middle-aged, stepped forward timidly. Carney, sir, he said deferentially. Now, Carney, tell just what happened from the time you got the call until you saw the young man die. Well, it was this way. The captain told me a gent up in room 16 wanted a menu and would have luncheon served in his room for himself and wife. I took the service elevator and came up. The man, Mr. Anson, was the only person I saw in the room. He was in his shirt sleeves, with his cuffs rolled back, as if he had been washing up. He was standing at the dresser when I came in. He'd just yelled, Come in! And I did. He told me he wanted luncheon for two right away. I gave him a pad to write his order on, and he studied the menu a while, and then he wrote what they wanted. He ordered a minute steak, French fried potatoes, French peas, tomato and lettuce salad, a chicken salad, half a grapefruit, and said be sure to put a maraschino cherry in the grapefruit as his wife liked them, a pot of coffee for two, and French pastry for both. Toasted rolls, too, I, I, I forgot to say. Ordered like a gentleman, sir, as if he knew good food. He give me fifty cents to hurry it up and I took his order and left. How long did you take? the sergeant asked. Plainly the laborous slow voice of the waiter got on his nerves. Are you sure there was nobody else in the room? About twenty minutes it took, sir. I didn't see anybody else in the room, but the lady might have been in the bathroom. 
but he didn't consult her about the order. I wondered at the time if she had already told him what she wanted. Oh, yes, the water was running in the bathroom. I forgot to tell you that. I could tell by the sound that somebody was running a bath. Yes, go on, the sergeant cut in. Well, sir, I come up with my load on the service elevators, down at the other end of the corridor from the passenger elevators. I took my folding table and the tray into the room and set up the table. When I opened the door, he called out, Here's the luncheon, dear. Hurry and let's eat while it's hot. I suppose he was talking to his wife, but I didn't hear her answer him. I finished setting the table, and he told me to come back for the things in about an hour, and I left. The waiter paused, for the sergeant was scanning the table with considerable interest. Flournoy stepped to his side, and the two talked in a low tone. I was just behind the house detective, so I heard what they said. Apparently ate with a good appetite, the sergeant said. Nearly all of the steak is gone, only two halves of rolls left, and a few spears of potato. Of course, that was the man's lunch. The lady must have liked her chicken salad. It's nearly all gone. Grapefruit, too. Hello. The French pastry is hardly touched. Either piece. What do you make of that? And he turned to Flournoy. I'd hate to say it reflects on the French pastry, Flournoy said, rather nettled. I should think it means that the two quarreled during the meal, and that their quarrel had made them lose their appetites. Did you notice the coffee? The sergeant tilted the cup at what he had decided was the man's place. A heavy residue of sugar remained. Then he did the same to the woman's cup. No sugar in the woman's cup, he said. The man must have had a sweet tooth. See, he ate more of his chocolate eclair than the lady did. About the only clue to the lady's identity so far is that she didn't take sugar in her coffee, he grinned. Well, Carney, said the sergeant, turning to the waiter again, you came back for the dishes in an hour? An hour and ten minutes, sir. I was busy in another suite, and the time went over just a mite. This room, as you know, is nearer the service elevators than it is the passenger lift. Well, I had just stepped out of the service elevator when I saw the door of room 16 open, and Mr. Anson staggered a step or two down the hall. He fell almost at my feet. He didn't speak a word, just fell. He walked like he had been pushed out of the room and couldn't get his balance again. The elevator starter saw him, too. He ran out of his car and we lifted the poor young man up. But we could see he was dead. We carried him into the room and put him on the bed. Did you see anybody in the room? No, sir. We looked about as soon as we had put him down, but there was nobody there, sir, or in the bathroom. We looked in the closets, too, thinking she might have hidden. I noticed the window was open, and I don't believe it was open when I was there first. Which window? The sergeant's excitement showed in his voice. That one that's open now, sir. It opens right on the fire escape, sir. I looked out of the window and down the fire escape, but I didn't see anybody climbing down. Do you think of anything else that might throw any light at all on this mystery, Carney? The sergeant's voice had a note of respect, for the meek waiter had made a good witness and had showed common sense immediately after the death of the boy. Nothing at all, sir, that I can think of now. But I'm still a bit dazed. If I think of anything else at all, sir, I'll tell you quick enough. I told you to have everybody here that could know anything about this thing. The sergeant turned to the house detective. Are the elevator boys here? All the boys who were running either service cars or passenger cars at the time are here, Mr. Marshall, Flournoy answered, a little truculently, I thought. It was evident that he resented the sergeant's manner. But an examination of the five or six boys brought out next to nothing. All passengers during those hours were pretty well accounted for, with one exception. A blonde woman of about thirty, looking like a motion picture actress in her heavy makeup, had got out of one of the cars at about twelve o'clock. 
The boy remembered the time, for it was his last trip in the car before going to his lunch. He had noticed her particularly, for he was a movie fan and always took more interest in passengers that might be picture people. But he didn't recognize the blonde painted woman. She went down the corridor, but in the opposite direction from room 16. He was sure of that, because he had watched her while he was holding the car for old Mrs. Peoples, who was half crippled and had to walk very slowly. He had never seen her in the hotel before, but then he had just been transferred from the service lift to the passenger elevator and wouldn't have seen her if she had been there dozens of times before. Flournoy, when questioned, said he did not recognize the woman from the boy's description, and the possible clue seemed to be lost in a blind alley. The significant thing about it, however, was that none of the boys remembered having taken her down. While the sergeant was fruitlessly interrogating the previous witnesses all over again, in the hope of turning up something else, I strolled about the room. The reporters from the other papers were grouped together near the open window, apparently doping out the case to their own satisfaction. There is nothing a reporter enjoys more than building up fine and often intricate and ridiculous theories to explain even the simplest case. In fact, they are paid to keep up the public's interest with such mysteries as long as possible. I paused at the dresser. The man's military brushes and a small pocket comb lay there. Also, a can of scentless talcum and a small bottle of fluid for keeping the hair in place. The usual impedimenta of the average American young man. The military brushes were of rather cheap quality, but the German silver plates on their backs were monogrammed with many flourishes. J. A. Either Jerry Anson was his real name, or he had fitted his alias to his own initials, a common enough habit in those who for any reason take assumed names. On the dressing table were evidences of the wife's occupancy, if indeed she was his wife. A box of perfumed face powder, a variety that sells for a dollar a box, was open, and grains of the powder had been spilled on the glass top of the dressing table. A somewhat soiled wool powder puff, backed with pink satin and a bit of fluffy white fur as a pom-pom, was crushed into the box of powder of a shade used only by olive-skinned women. Beside the powder lay a lipstick, a very dark red. The gold cap had been removed, showing that the lipstick had been used in that room. There was no rouge box, but I was reminded of the fact that many olive-skinned women do not use rouge on their cheeks, depending only on the scarlet of their lips for vividness. On the other side of the dressing table lay a comb and brush and hand mirror of ordinary white ivory, marked on the back with a hand-painted design of blue forget-me-nots. The comb was almost clean. If hair had been combed with it that day, then the hair had been very clean and free from oil. But in the brush there was caught a hair or two, hairs of a reddish-brown color. I strolled up to the sergeant, who was talking with Flournoy, the house detective. The woman you want is not a blonde, I said. She's brunette, with reddish-brown hair, slightly curly. She does not rouge her cheeks, which are olive-tinted. And she does use a dark red lipstick, probably very heavily. Her hair has just been shampooed. The sergeant was staring at me as if I were a seeress. Who in the world are you, and how do you know so much? he demanded. Miss Austin of the press, Flournoy chuckled as he introduced us. The sergeant followed me to the dressing table, where I went over my findings. He seemed to be entirely convinced of their soundness, and immediately detailed two plainclothes men to make inquiries for such a person as I had described, both in the hotel and in the principal shops for it was not forgotten that Mrs. Anson was supposed to be shopping while her husband was getting the room at the Alexandria. Would you mind telling me what you found in the man's pockets and luggage that would give me any clues to his personality or identity? I asked the sergeant. I was not here when you made the search. Certainly, he replied. He stopped to open the handsome black cowhide suitcase at his feet. 
Here's everything that was found. Suit of lavender silk pajamas, brand new, never been slept in. A white silk shirt, not badly worn, but still, it's seen its best days. Two white, near linen handkerchiefs, unmarked, even by a laundry. A pair of black silk socks with holes in the toes. If he had a wife, she didn't mend his socks, that's a cinch. That's all there was in the suitcase. In his pockets we found no money, just a small change purse, entirely empty. This little red book that's supposed to be a guide to Los Angeles streets and public buildings, and a yellow lead pencil. I looked at the stuff with keen interest, but its meagerness and commonplaceness discouraged my detective instincts. The patent conclusion, which had already been reached by Flournoy and the sergeant, as they told me quickly enough, was that the young man had intended to stay only one night in the Alexandria, and that, unless he had some hidden source of money, had intended to beat his hotel bill. Maybe his wife carried the purse, I suggested. That may be the reason he was so distressed over her long shopping orgy. Had it occurred to you that there are no women's garments in this suitcase? Doesn't that indicate that she wasn't his wife at all, that she met him here only for an amorous adventure? I realized too late that the other reporters, three of whom were still lingering, were absorbing my conclusions and would undoubtedly use them and add to them as their own. But only one of them worked on an evening newspaper, and he was of the aggressive kind that scorns other people's opinions. If he used mine, it would only be to refute them, and I needed all the meat I could get for the story I would have to hurry back to the office for the final edition. Then if the boy was having an adventure, he was pretty poorly provided with the wherewithal, and Flournoy grinned. Maybe that's what they quarreled about. He admitted to her over the French pastry and coffee that he was broke, and she reproached him, and he ended it all. I think it was suicide, he concluded. Then where is the container for the poison, I demanded. The policeman had been searching both bedroom and bath for the box or any other sort of container, but without results. Flournoy had also had the ground beneath the window thoroughly gone over. I neglected to mention that the room was a rear one, and that the fire escape led down into a rear court or areaway. A box hurled from the window just before the fatal dose had been taken would easily have been recovered, but there was no such box. Dr. Braddock, the house physician, had accompanied the body to the morgue, but the police had already gotten his verdict, death by cyanide poisoning. Of course, a post-mortem would be held, but its results would not become public before the next day, or even for two days. I spent a few more minutes in studying the lay of the luncheon table, which had not been touched or disturbed in any way, and then I telephoned my paper from the room, the facts as far as I knew them at the time. The city editor had already sent our staff photographer to the morgue to photograph the young man, and his picture appeared in the final edition, which reached the streets around six o'clock. When I went to the office, I elaborated the story in my own style, creating a picture of the sought-for woman and describing with minute care the looks of the man, the room, and the examination of the witnesses. Then, in our usual sensational style, I queried the public. One. Who is Jerry Anson? 2. Who was the olive-skinned, curly-haired woman who ate lunch with him and then fled when Jerry Anson was dying of cyanide poisoning? 3. Was Jerry Anson murdered by the woman who fled down the fire escape, or was he a suicide? 4. Did the woman flee because she was not his wife and could not risk exposure and scandal? I predicted that an analysis of the food on the table would show that the cyanide had been taken in the cup of coffee, which had been less than half finished when Jerry Anson staggered from the table to die before he could summon help. That was another point which I stressed in my murder theory. If Jerry Anson had been determined to commit suicide, why did he stagger out of his room to seek help from the elevator man? The fact that he had left his room, instead of looking toward the woman for help, indicated to me that she had either left the room before he drank the deadly coffee, or he knew her to be his murderess. 
I also reminded my readers of the old adage that no one commits suicide on a full stomach. There is something so heartening about good hot food that trouble seemed to lift, if only for an hour. Of course, the authorities had immediately notified Oakland of the death of Jerry Anson, and a wire to our staff correspondent there brought a long reply by wire. Although it was after nine o'clock when the answer came, I was telephoned for at my home. On my arrival, I was shown the wire and given a hurry-up assignment. Mrs. Amelia Anson, Jerry's mother, had been located by our reporter. Before she succumbed to grief prostration, she denied most emphatically that he was married or had been engaged to be married, so far as she knew. She said that he had left Oakland two days before his death, intending to find work, and had gone to the home of his cousins, Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Lord, of Long Beach. She had had a letter from him written the day before his death and received just a few hours before our reporter broke the news of his death to her. The letter was optimistic. He said he was having a good time at his cousin's house, told how much he admired his second cousin, 16-year-old Alfreda Lord, and said he hoped to land a good job the next day. The letter ended with a request for a small loan of $20 to tide him over his job hunt. The mother tearfully protested that her boy was a thoroughly good son, but he had been unfortunate in the matter of jobs. She had immediately dispatched a letter with a money order for $30, more than he had asked for. She also protested that he would not commit suicide because he was broke. He knew she would always send him something, all she could afford. I want you to hustle out to Long Beach and see this girl, a uh, freight lord, before the police get on the track of these cousins he was visiting, the Night City editor told me. I had no trouble in locating the lords, for our Oakland correspondent had given the correct address. I found the household in a state of terrific excitement. Not only had they read my sensational account of the Anson boy's death, together with its description of the woman whose personal appearance I had built up from her cosmetics, but their daughter was missing. I sensed immediately their dreadful fear of me and guessed its cause, even before I saw a portrait of the young girl hanging on the wall of the stuffy little sitting room. She had lovely curly hair, and her great lustrous brown eyes indicated an olive complexion. "'Have you any idea where your daughter is?' I asked. She, "'She's at the home of a girlfriend. She told us she was going to spend the night there,' the mother offered tremblingly, looking toward her haggard-faced, silent husband. "'Mother, we've got to find Alfreda. There's no use beating about the bush.' the husband said suddenly. She can explain where she's been. Then to me, we've called up her girlfriend's house, and she hasn't been there all day. Did she or Jerry leave the house first? I asked. She did, her mother answered, crying freely now. Oh, this is terrible. Was Jerry in love with Alfreda? I probed relentlessly. He, he hardly knew her the father said slowly. He was here a lot last summer, but Alfreda was nearly always out with the other youngsters. I think he admired her a lot. He was always telling her how pretty she is. But I know she didn't give him a thought. The man's careful reply told me that I had hit upon a sore spot. Evidently, the mother and father knew that Jerry Anson had been crazy about the girl. This was the basis of their wild fears now. I was about to leave the house when I asked suddenly if I might see the girl's room. They consented, exchanging fearful glances. The walls of the little room were almost covered with pictures of movie stars, mostly of the sleek-haired, chic type. The little white dresser was almost bare, but in the middle stood what I had been looking for, a small white ivory tray decorated with blue forget-me-nots. "'This is very pretty. Did your daughter paint it?' I asked. "'Yes,' both father and mother answered immediately with a touch of pride. "'Where is the rest of the set?' I asked. "'I'd like to see the other pieces.' The mother opened a bureau drawer 
and then looked blankly at me. The other pieces were gone. Without increasing their terror by telling them what I thought, I took my leave. I was sure the city editor would want to get out an extra on the facts I had obtained, and I was in a hurry to get to a telephone. As I was walking rapidly down the path, I almost stumbled against a figure crouching beneath a small palm tree. Even before I raised her to her feet, I knew who it was. Alfreda Lord had come home to face the music, whatever the tune might be. I went with her into the house and heard her tearful yet defiant rebuttal of her parents' frantic accusations. When her mother told her that they had called the girlfriend and had found that Alfreda had not been at her home, she hesitated, then told them her story. Her story was pitifully weak. She said she had gone to the beach for a swim, had rented a bathing suit, and stayed in the water until nearly lunchtime. She had gone into Los Angeles for lunch at the Pig and Whistle alone, and had then gone to a movie at the Kinema Theater. After dinner, still alone, she had gone to another movie at the Mission Theater, and had then taken the trolley to Long Beach. Alone? All that time? I inquired skeptically. Yes. I wanted Pearl to go with me, but she had a date, so I decided to spend one day just as I pleased. Where did you get the money for your lonesome party? I prodded her. I made it myself, she protested. I worked as an extra for three days last week over on the new art lot. The next day the girl was arrested, charged with the murder of Jerry Anson. The presence of her comb and brush and mirror, together with her favorite brand of face powder and lipstick, seemed sufficient evidence for the grand jury then in session. Her alibi had been completely exploded before Jerry Anson had been dead twenty-four hours. It looked very black indeed for pretty little Alfreda Lord. I interviewed her twice, trying to wring a confession from her, or at least an honest story of her luncheon with Jerry Anson. But she stoutly, sullenly, and defiantly asserted her innocence of any connection at all with his death. She said she had not seen him since his last breakfast at her home. When I reminded her that her own alibi had been ripped to ribbons, she shut up and refused to answer any more questions. Chemical analysis of the food left on the luncheon table revealed the presence of cyanide only in the cup of coffee from which the boy had drunk. At the order of the district attorney, the luncheon table had been left exactly as it was when the death was discovered, with the exception of the removal of portions of food. Two or three detectives had gone over everything thoroughly, but still Room 16 remained just as Jerry Anson had left it, and would remain so until every possible clue had been exhausted. Although the girl had been arrested, a case had to be built up against her, and the room itself offered the only possible source for clues, it seemed. Could the girl be guilty? An hour after the lusty lung newsboys had begun to screen their gruesome invitation to read about the Anson murder mystery, I was still at my desk, lost in a brown study. Some loose end kept hammering at my brain, demanding to be cleared up. And suddenly I saw daylight. I grabbed my telephone. A long minute later I was talking to the chief of detectives. Have you had a report from the fingerprint experts yet? I demanded. They're working on them now, the chief answered. They've taken the prints from nearly everything in the room. Especially the dishes and silver, I insisted. Sure, the chief came back. Hold the line and I'll see when they expect to be finished. A little later came the good news. Be ready to show them to you in less than half an hour. A taxi took me quickly to the hotel, which had settled down to normal. Flournoy, the house detective, seemed glad to see me. Well, have we found the mystery girl, Miss Detective? he asked teasingly. No, and yes, I replied, for I don't believe there was one. Flournoy looked at me inquiringly, about to ask a question, but I hurried him on up to room 16. What do you mean about the woman? Flournoy asked, entering the room directly behind me. Just what I said. There was no lady. 
Jerry Anson was here alone. He committed suicide, did it to get even with the girl who had turned him down. I'll bet my life. I'll fray to Lord. Wanted to go out in a blaze of publicity and to cause as much trouble and excitement as he could. He stole Alfreda's toilet set and planted it in the room. Probably thought Alfreda could prove an alibi, but wanted to get even with her and cause her a lot of trouble anyway. And what about the lunch she ate? We know from the post-mortem he didn't eat it. She didn't eat it either. Instead, he threw it away. Washed it away, rather. Flournoy looked at me a moment, then started toward the bathroom. What about the container for the cyanide, he asked. That, too. And what's more, I'll be willing to bet a week's pay you will find traces of mayonnaise, a slight film of grease left behind from the salad in there, to prove my point. Flournoy returned from the bathroom a minute later, smiling broadly. You're right, he said. Whatever started you on this track? Well, I admitted, there was one little clue that struck me as significant all along. The girl was supposed to have used a lipstick just before the luncheon, but one of the first things I noticed was that there was no little line of red on the grapefruit spoon, and there always is on my spoon. The darn stuff just will come off. All my surmises proved to be entirely correct, and the fingerprints found on the china proved definitely that no one had been in the room except Jerry Anson. Alfreda had refused Jerry's proposal of marriage the night before he died, so she told us later. He was not the first love-smitten swain to seek solace in death. End of The Mystery of Room 16 by Anne Austin The Mystery of the Semi-Detached by Edith Nesbitt This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sam Bartle The Mystery of the Semi-Detached He was waiting for her. He had been waiting an hour and a half in a dusty suburban lane with a row of big elms on one side, and some eligible building sites on the other, and far away to the southwest, the twinkling yellow lights of the Crystal Palace. It was not quite like a country lane, for it had a pavement and lamp posts, but it was not a bad place for a meeting all the same, and further up, towards the cemetery, it was really quite rural and almost pretty, especially in twilight but twilight had long deepened into night, and still he waited. He loved her, and he was engaged to be married to her, with the complete disapproval of every reasonable person who had been consulted, and this half-clandestine meeting was tonight to take the place of the grudgingly sanctioned weekly interview, because a certain rich uncle was visiting at her house, and her mother was not the woman to acknowledge to a moneyed uncle who might go off any day, a match so deeply ineligible as hers with him. So he waited for her, and the chill of an unusually severe May evening entered into his bones. The policeman passed him with but a surly response to his good night. The bicyclists went by him like grey ghosts with foghorns, and it was nearly ten o'clock, and she had not come. He shrugged his shoulders, and turned towards his lodgings. His road led him by her house, desirable, commodious, semi-detached. And he walked slowly as he neared it. She might, even now, be coming out. But she was not. There was no sign of movement about the house, no sign of life, no lights even in the windows, and her people were not early people. He paused by the gate, wondering. Then he noticed that the front door was open, wide open, and the street lamp shone a little way into the dark hall. There was something about all this that did not please him, that scared him a little, indeed. 
The house had a gloomy and deserted air. It was obviously impossible that it harboured a rich uncle. The old man must have left early. In which case... He walked up the path of patent glazed tiles and listened. No sign of life. He passed into the hall. There was no light anywhere. Where was everybody? And why was the front door open? There was no one in the drawing room. The dining room and the study, nine feet by seven, were equally blank. Everyone was out, evidently. But the unpleasant sense that he was perhaps not the first casual visitor to walk through that open door impelled him to look through the house before he went away and closed it after him. So he went upstairs, and at the door of the first bedroom he came to, he struck a wax match, as he had done in the sitting rooms. Even as he did so, he felt that he was not alone, and he was prepared to see something. But for what he saw, he was not prepared. For what he saw lay on the bed, in a white, loose gown, and it was his sweetheart, and its throat was cut from ear to ear. He doesn't know what happened then, nor how he got downstairs and into the street, but he got out somehow, and the policeman found him in a fit under the lamp post at the corner of the street. He couldn't speak when they picked him up, and he passed the night in the police cells because the policeman had seen plenty of drunken men before, but never one in a fit. The next morning he was better, though still very white and shaky. But the tale he told the magistrate was convincing, and they sent a couple of constables with him to her house. There was no crowd about it as he had fancied there would be, and the blinds were not down. As he stood, dazed, in the front of the door, it opened, and she came out. He held on the doorpost for support. "'She's all right, you see,' said the constable, who had found him under the lamp. "'I told you you was drunk, but you would know best.' When he was alone with her, he told her, "'Not all, for that would not bear telling, but how he had come into the commodious semi-detached and how he had found the door open and the lights out, and that he had been into that long back room facing the stairs, and had seen something. In even trying to hint, at which he turned sick and broke down, and had to have a brandy given him. But my dearest, she said, I dare say the house was dark, for we were all at the Crystal Palace with my uncle, and no doubt the door was open, for the maids will run out if they're left. "'but you could not have been in that room "'because I locked it when I came away, "'and the key was in my pocket. "'I dressed in a hurry, "'and I left all my odds and ends lying about. "'I know,' he said. "'I saw a green scarf on the chair "'and some long brown gloves "'and a lot of hairpins and ribbons "'and a prayer book "'and a lace handkerchief on the dressing table. "'Why, I even noticed the almanac on the mantelpiece, "'October 21st. "'At least it couldn't be that, because this is May.' And yet it was. Your almanac is at October 21st, isn't it? No, of course it isn't, she said, smiling rather anxiously. But all the other things were just as you say. You must have had a dream or a vision or something. He was a very ordinary, commonplace, city young man. And he didn't believe in visions. But he never rested day or night till he got his sweetheart and her mother away from that commodious semi-detached and settled them in a quite distant suburb. In the course of the removal, he incidentally married her, and the mother went on living with them. His nerves must have been a good bit shaken, because he was very queer for a long time, and was always inquiring if anyone had taken the desirable semi-detached. And when an old stockbroker with his family took it, he went the length of calling on the old gentleman, and imploring him, by all that he held dear, not to live in that fatal house. Why? said the stockbroker, not unnaturally. And then he got so vague and confused, between trying to tell why and trying not to tell why, that the stockbroker showed him out, and thanked his God he was not such a fool as to allow a lunatic to stand in the way of his taking that really remarkably cheap and desirable semi-detached residence. 
Now, the curious and quite inexplicable part of this story is that when she came down to breakfast on the morning of the 22nd of October, she found him looking like death, with the morning paper in his hand. He caught hers. He couldn't speak, and pointed to the paper. And there she read that on the night of the 21st, a young lady, the stockbroker's daughter, had been found, with her throat cut from ear to ear, on the bed in the long back bedroom facing the stairs of that desirable semi-detached. End of the Mystery of the Semi-Detached by Edith Nesbitt The Man Who Lived Next Door to Himself by Frank Owen From Weird Tales, May, 1924 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman The Man Who Lived Next Door to Himself by Frank Owen I had not lived in the old house on Sheridan Square a week before I received a visit from my next-door neighbor, and at once my interest was aroused. His name was Aladina Vizarain, and he was full-blooded Persian from Sultanabad. Never have I met a man who was more learned and cultured than he. The Oriental and the Occidental had contributed their best to his knowledge. He was both a doctor of medicine and philosophy, an ardent devotee of research work of any kind. There was nothing about his appearance that would have caused comment as he passed along the street, unless one remarked on his finely molded, clear-cut features and the intense brilliance of his keen black eyes. He dressed simply, in dark clothes of American make, and the quietness of his manner gave him dignity and even charm. His voice was as distinct and clear as though he had studied elocution for years. Yet so soft did he speak, the words seemed to be but echoes of a dream. Since we are evidently to be neighbors for a considerable time, he said slowly, I thought it would not be out of place for me to call and introduce myself. As a rule, when a man moves into a country town, all the neighbors visit him almost immediately. This is not the custom in the city. Yet how much more lonesome and cold is the great metropolis? To walk among crowds and to behold no familiar face is worse than to journey alone through the desert. At my invitation he seated himself in a great chair by the side of the open hearth a companion one to mine, and together we talked about a miscellanea of trivial things until an unearthly hour. It was, I thought, the beginning of a friendship, which was to continue for many a long day. But if I had known that evening how close that friendship was destined to be, my eyes would have bulged from their sockets in stark, raving terror. That evening was one of many which we spent together, we had much in common, we found, for we were both writers, and both of us were intensely interested in unusual things. For years, said Aladina Vishrain one evening as we sat smoking cigars before the fire in my rooms, I have been somewhat a student of psychology, psychoanalysis, spiritualism, and the transition of souls. In our religion, we are all like children. The Christians scoff at the yogi and the theosophist. The Buddhists and the Mohammedans look down on people of all other religions. Is it not amusing? Every man thinks his own belief is the true religion. The South Sea Islander worshipping the moon and the stars, and the Siamese refusing to kill rattlesnakes and looking with awe at sacred tigers the natives of India bowing before sick white elephants. 
Is not life a most interesting enigma? We imagine that we have advanced a great deal since the Stone Age. But have we actually progressed at all? Does not the recent European conflict prove that the caveman is still very much alive within us? The changes recorded have been solely in exterior things, such as dress and manners. Man scoffed at Morse when he spoke of his telegraph, but it came to be, and now we have radio as well. We have learned to pick up messages from the very ether about us. Some day, other things will be accomplished quite easily, which are now only spoken of in theory. Science is still very much in its infancy. For more than ten years I have believed that it would be possible for two men to exchange their souls if they were in the proper key, in perfect harmony, and tuned with one another. That is to say, to put it more concisely, I believe that it might be possible for your soul to enter my body, and my soul to enter your body. And when I speak of a soul, I mean all that intangible part of a person that is mental his mind, thoughts, likes and dislikes, ideas, etc. The great Caruso used to tap a glass with a knife, and then sing the same note as came from the tinkling glass. When the two notes met at exactly the same moment, the glass was shattered to atoms. You see the notes opposed each other. Now if two natures, or souls, were in perfect harmony, without opposition of any kind, who knows what might be accomplished if the impulse of both were toward the same object. I am deeply interested in what you say, I told him. It is a rather wild theory, but I am sufficient of a scientist never to laugh at anything. Only fools ridicule that which they do not understand. I am glad to hear you speak like that, he went on, for had your manner been otherwise, I would have terminated the present conversation when I finished speaking a moment ago. However, since you are so obviously interested, I will proceed to acquaint you with my theory. As he spoke, he drew from his pocket a round crystal ball, about three inches in diameter. It was so clear and polished that it shone in the fire glow like a great round diamond. It was so clear and polished that it shone in the fire glow like a great round diamond. This thought sphere came from the east, he said slowly, and there are many legendary tales connected with it. It is said that he who possesses it can have what he desires. Whether or not there is any truth in this, I cannot say. And yet you are my friend. Our personalities are in harmony, and that is all I desire. If you are agreeable, we will attempt right now to materialize my theory. He did not wait for me to assent. He took my acquiescence for granted. He walked over and placed the ball in the center of the small teakwood table. Then he placed two chairs beside the table so that they were directly opposite each other. As he did so, he said, Come, and who knows, perhaps it will be your good fortune to be a participant in one of the greatest discoveries of the age. He seated himself at the table. Before you sit down, he directed, swish off the lights, for a room in darkness save for the glow of the fire is far more fitting for such an experiment as we are to attempt than one that is brilliantly lighted. After doing as he desired, plunging the room in semi-darkness, I sat down opposite him. Now, he said slowly, you must concentrate your whole mind on this experiment. Ku says that the imagination controls the will. Perhaps he is right. I never argue. But I think the imagination and the will both react on one another. We are desirous of exchanging souls, or perhaps I should say, personalities, for the word soul, at best, is a rather ambiguous term suited mostly to the art of poets. 
you must let your gaze rest intently on the crystal ball you must will it to make the exchange and you must let your imagination make you believe that the exchange has been effected i will do the same thing and if we can make our desires coincide perfectly at the exact moment through the medium of the crystal ball what we desire will assuredly come to pass it is written that a man can have what he wishes if he wants it sufficiently enough he ceased speaking and we both focused our gaze intently on the crystal ball the room was in utter silence it was in the back of the house so no discordant sound from the street shattered the solitude which was so intense that it seemed to hang about the room in folds and the far corners of the room seemed to be enveloped in curtains of velvet black no object was discernible except that queer little crystal globulate which shimmered fantastically in the fire glow seeming to scintillate with a dozen different prismatic colors and now as we sat staring at it it suddenly commenced to glow with a strange blue light all the other tones of color faded evidently the fire in the grate had burned low and only a bit of blue flame remained and yet the color of the crystal ball increased steadily the light intensified it was almost blinding it blurred my vision everything grew hazy as though i were enveloped in a fog the silence was as cold as death i seemed to be losing consciousness then steadily the crystal ball came back into focus again my vision cleared the blue flame had died out and again the scintillating colors returned it was the most odd experience but odder still was the realization that i was gazing at the crystal ball from the other side of the table it was as though i had changed my seat with a cry of surprise i jumped to my feet for i knew that i had not moved since i had seated myself at the table as i rose i knocked over the table and the crystal ball crashed to the ground and was shattered into a thousand glittering pieces Vizrain quickly switched on the lights what have you done he fairly shrieked now we are engulfed in a frightful calamity we can never again get back our own personalities as i looked into his eyes my blood turned cold for i was gazing into my own face the experiment had proved successful i scarcely know how to set down the events that followed there is so much that i would like to write so much i wish to record and yet it is hard to set down the things that have an important bearing on my particular case for a while that night this rain and i raved about that room as though we were mad we cursed and raved as though we had ceased to be human often we hear folks envying each other expressing a desire to be in someone else's place now that particular position had been vouchsafed to me and i found little pleasure in it i longed to be in my own body again the body at best is but a shell in which we live but it is the shell by which we are known the tangible thing by which our friends recognize us probably the day will eventually come when men will cease to form opinions and impressions from exteriors again we had raved about the room for an hour or perhaps it was longer for neither of us had any thought of time we sat down beside the open fire again and tried to sanely reason out the strange problem with which we were confronted we had changed bodies i say we advisedly because the real man lives inside each one of us the smug hypocritical smile and the exaggerated burst of assumed enthusiasm are not the earmarks of a real person this rain's soul and personality were within my body but nevertheless he was still this rain after we had talked and argued and theorized for a great while we finally decided that we would change houses voluntarily even as we had changed bodies this would mechanically prevent people from talking and besides 
we were not to be inconvenienced in the slightest because we could visit back and forth as often as we desired it was thus that i found myself in the peculiar position of living next door to myself luckily both visrain and i lived alone so there was no one to complicate matters although that is not strictly true for visrain had a japanese servant named koto who was the very acme of perfection he seemed to anticipate his master's every want and it was a source of keen enjoyment to be waited on by him my nearest relative dwelt in san francisco an aunt with whom i never corresponded she was as interested in me as though i did not exist at all and as for myself i heartily reciprocated the compliment i was not anxious to build up a friendship with the eccentric old lady because i realized that by so doing i might be bothered with visits from her and this i wished to avoid at best i have but little patience and can only tolerate people with whom i have much in common such a person was vera gray an artist who lived in greenwich village and earned a splendid living drawing cover designs for the national magazines vera was a girl in a million a deep thinker and at the same time more beautiful than any of the models who posed for her she had skin like old ivory and the olive tone to her complexion together with her wondrous taste in dress made of her a most alluring girl she was tall and slim and her white hands were the most graceful and expressive i have ever beheld they made almost a symphony in loveliness i suppose i am writing rather madly yet i assure you i am sane enough i have recently been examined by three alienists and while they admit that i am somewhat queer they have unanimously stated that my mentality is far above the average but i am getting ahead of my story it is hard when writing a narrative of this sort to keep the sequence of events in their proper order although i hated to mention vera gray to this rain i knew that i had to do so for if i had disappeared entirely she would have immediately raised an alarm and publicity more than anything else we desired to avoid you must call on vera gray i told this rain and i think it might be wise for me to accompany you that will help to lessen the chances of your making a bad blunder talk very little and consult me whenever the opportunity presents itself at this interview we must be extremely careful a few evenings later we visited vera gray luck was with us for there were several other persons in her apartment and one young fellow in particular gordon harris wished to do all the talking he went into ecstasies over vera's paintings and had something to say about every one she exhibited only once did she and i get an opportunity to converse together i'm delighted that you came tonight she said sincerely because you interest me in a rather strange way you seem to remind me of someone i know very well yet i am positive that i have never beheld your face before until tonight sometime i hope you will come to tea and we can have a rather interesting chat together when none of these ceaseless talkers are present i suppose it is rather unconventional for me to invite you when you are a total stranger to me but i feel that we have something in common as though we knew each other years ago she laughed softly perhaps she said the theosophists are right after all and you and i were friends more than ten thousand years ago i had no time to answer for gordon harris came and claimed her attention and i cannot say that i was sorry for under the circumstances to such a speech what is there for me to say as we walked home another complication arose this rain confessed to me that he loved her she is the most adorably perfect girl i have ever known he told me and i am the most miserable of men no doubt as long as my personality is in your body i could go in and win her but i hate the deception and i wouldn't want to do anything that was unfair to you 
for already i think i have caused you trouble enough but despite his words to the contrary miss rain did make love to vera gray and she seemed far more attracted to him than she had ever been to me i am never unhappy when i am with you she told him frankly no matter how trivial is the subject we discuss i am always interested you used to bore me sometimes but now all that has passed this rain placed his arm about her something stronger than life stronger than death is drawing us together he breathed tensely there is no use in either of us fighting against it it is destiny Allah wills that we should live united. He drew her unresisting to him. Promise me, he said, that you will marry me before summer comes. And in a fit of recklessness, she promised. Late that night, Visrain made known his perfidy to me. In all fairness to him, I must admit that he confessed everything quite openly there is no use fighting against love he cried it is the most subtle poison known do you think i am happy i am the most miserable man in all the world first i rob you of your body now i have robbed you of your love nowhere on earth is there so vile a thief as i but i am poisoned by love i cannot i will not live without vera gray yet i am unworthy of her he stormed and raged up and down the room like a caged beast. I said no word because I realized that none was needed. His own conscience was scouring his soul far worse than anything I could have said. I just sat there carved of stone, watching the torment which he was suffering. His eyes glistened as though he were almost mad. He tore up and down the room as though he wished to escape from himself but that is not strictly true he was unhappy because he wished to escape from myself it was my body which had caused him all his sorrow finally i arose from my chair i think i will go to bed i told him simply he made no answer and i left the room and walked back to the house next door in five minutes i was in bed but i could not sleep I lay and tossed upon my pillow as though I were the victim of acute insomnia. And yet, somehow, although I feigned weariness, I knew that I was really far from sleep. There seemed to be an ominous silence in the air, a calm such as might precede a deadly tropical storm. It seemed to me as though some dreadful calamity was imminent, but what that calamity was, I had not the faintest idea. My room was as dark as the inside of a coffin. I could not distinguish a thing because of the heavy curtains, which were carefully drawn across the windows. The blackness was so intense that it seemed peopled with all sorts of wild wraiths and distorted forms. I knew the hallucinations were but the imagining of my overwrought nerves, yet the great bulk of blackness seemed to bear down upon me as though it were a solid thing i felt as though i were suffocating as though i were engulfed alive in a pit of blackness my forehead was cold with a dank sweat and my hands shook as though i were a hundred years old i switched on the electric lights and looked at my face or rather i should say miss rain's face in the mirror it was ashen gray Hastily I dressed. I seemed impelled onward by some great hidden force. When I had finished dressing, I crept cautiously down the stairs. I was careful to make no sound that would awaken Koto, who slept in a little room off the lower hall. Silently, I crept from the house and stole to the house next door. I unlocked the front door and entered like a thief. I had no trouble in effecting an entrance because Vis Rain and I carried keys to both houses. We believed it would more readily facilitate matters if we did so. Inside I found the light in the living room still burning. I walked to the threshold, and there I stopped, as though frozen to ice, and well I might, 
where the sight which I beheld was the most awful man ever gazed upon. In the chair was my own body. Blood was trickling sluggishly from a bullet wound in the right temple. By the side of the table lay a revolver. Facing a problem which he could not solve, Visrain had blown out his brains. For one brief moment I gazed at the ghastly sight. Then my overwrought nerves broke, and I slipped to the floor unconscious. How long I remained so I do not know, for when I opened my eyes it was broad daylight. In the chair the body still sat, and I imagined an eerie smile hovered over the rigid lips as though it were grinning at me. I rose to my feet. My head ached dully, and I walked like a man who had been ill for ages. I could scarcely drag one foot after the other. I seated myself in a chair opposite the lifeless body and stared at it as though my very gaze could rekindle it with life again. Now my predicament was worse than ever. My body was dead, sitting grotesquely before me in a great chair. I was surprised that the expression on its face could ever be so frightful. Lost to me also was my friend. What had happened to his soul I did not know. Perhaps it also was in the room with me. I shuddered as I thought that now Visrain would try to reclaim his body. The days that immediately followed I can only look back on as a nightmare. I did not employ an undertaker to embalm the body, nor did I make any attempt to see that it was decently buried. Under the circumstances, I doubt if anyone else would have done so either. Despite the ghastly, blood-clotted, repulsive face, the body was mine. And I was still alive. I could not make myself believe that my body was really dead. As the days dragged on, I found myself more and more often creeping into the house next door to gaze into that face which was turning a sickly blue. Sometimes I used to frantically shake the loathsome corpse as though it were only sleeping, and that if I tried hard enough I could awaken it. It drew me to it like a magnet. Many a night I remained with the hideous thing till dawn. I think at the time I must have been slightly insane. Yet, as I have written, Three alienists have recently examined me, and they pronounced my mind to be in excellent condition. Still, my actions were not those of a sane person. I used to sit and talk to the corpse by the hour. I argued and expostulated with it. Sometimes I attempted to make it eat and drink. Once I even succeeded in pouring a bit of liquor through the set lips. A thing which gave me hope was the fact that the beard on the face continued to grow. How could a corpse be dead, I argued, and the beard still grow? I have since learned that it is a perfectly natural phenomenon, that it is quite usual for a man's hair to grow after he has ceased to live. And now it seemed to me that my cup of despair was filled to the brim, that no further calamity could be added to it. Yet the figure had still another horror in store for me. One night, as I bent over the corpse, I suddenly became conscious that I was not alone in the house. I had not heard a sound, nor had I caught the faintest glimpse of anyone, but still I was sure there was at least one other person in the house besides myself. At such moments it seems as though a man has a supernatural sixth sense buried in his subconscious mind, which warns him of approaching danger. To say I was shocked would not nearly have described my condition. I was in a panic. Fear made of me a total wreck. The very marrow froze in my bones, and I felt as sick and weak as though I were a plague victim. Even in my fear I realized that I was in a most unexplainable position unless the hidden personage should prove to be the soul of Aladina Visrain. 
As the thought came to me, the curtains at the end of the room parted slightly, and through the opening I could see the muzzle of a revolver leveled directly at me. As I beheld it, I quickly switched off the electric lights, plunging the room into absolute darkness. Then I made a wild leap for the other door, but in the darkness I tripped over the corpse with such force that I dragged it from the chair, and together we fell to the floor with a dull thud. Fear now had me absolutely in its power. I lost my reason. Instead of trying to get away, I commenced wrestling with the lifeless body, and as I wrestled there came to my already weakened nerves another severe shock. As we writhed about the floor, two hands clutched at my throat and anchored there, with a frightful grip. It seemed as though the dead had come back to life again. Then other hands grasped my arms and legs. There seemed to be at least a half dozen bodies bending over me. In that moment my strength seemed to multiply. Dread made of me a formidable opponent. I became a machine. I flung my arms about in every direction, like flails. Sometimes my fists crashed against warm flesh, and I could hear the grunts of my adversaries as the blows struck home. But the hands around my throat gripped tighter. I could scarcely breathe. I struggled terribly for breath. For one bit of air I would have given all I possessed in the world. Finally, someone mercifully turned on the lights, and to my horror I found myself surrounded by policemen. None too gently, they slipped a pair of handcuffs over my wrists. But I did not care for the one who held my throat released his grip, and I could breathe again. Now I am sitting in a prison cell. I am to be tried next week for murder, the murder of my own self. They would not allow me to be released on bail, for in the eyes of the world I have taken a human life. Ever since my disappearance detectives have been searching for me. It was Vera Gray who raised the alarm, now I am writing the true story of all that has transpired. I intend to present it at my trial. What the verdict will be I cannot say, nor do I really care, for they have buried my body, and Vera has gone into mourning, because she believes I am dead. Even if I am acquitted, what does the future hold in store for me? I have been examined by three alienists since I have been in prison. They are unanimous in declaring me sane. Perhaps this will help my case somewhat. I also intend to see Vera. I shall recall to her countless little incidents that happened in the past that are known only to her and me. I believe, in time, when my story becomes known, I will be acquitted, but it may take months, and afterwards what have I to look forward to? nothing but memories memories of vera which are sadly beautiful memories of my dead body sitting upright in a house next door which are so ghastly that they will haunt me forever i will be just a poor broken down bit of humanity a man who once lived next door to himself and has ceased to be happy now that his neighbor is gone the end of the Man Who Lived Next Door to Himself by Frank Owen Snake by Galen C. Collin From Weird Tales, January 1924 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Dale Grothman Snake by Galen C. Collin It was Saturday afternoon, and the men of Moreland County were gathered, as was their custom, on the porch of the post office at Clayton Springs. They were watching a man, who was a stranger to most of them, making his way toward them down the trail from the hills. "'It's Ben Tibbets,' said Jim Bates. "'He's the feller that came over the divide a month or two ago.' and built a cabin about ten miles up the trail. 
don't know much about him, but what I do know is too much. He beats his wife. With that, he spat disgustedly on the porch floor. As Ben Tibbets came nearer, a playful puppy, one of the pack that always followed Jean Barton, ran to meet him. With an oath, he gave the puppy a brutal kick and sent it sprawling ten feet and rushed at the stranger. Instead of defending himself, Tibbets grovelled at Jean's feet. He fairly writhed in fright. Every movement, every expression showed terror beyond control with disgust sean spurned him with a foot and walked back to the group of interested watchers cowardly snake was his only comment and snake was his name from that time on to the men of these western mountains swarth and low-browed he was with long gorilla-like arms his eyes were small and beady black and furtive all the cunning and lack of conscience of a swamp moccasin were shown in his shifty glance trapping was ostensibly his occupation rumor had it otherwise hundreds of chinese were smuggled across the border much of this smuggling was attributed to snake and the immigration officers were constantly watching him he was never caught red-handed for he was too sly and patient he made no move until he was absolutely safe a fiery temper had snake physical cowardice abject terror at the thought of physical injury made him hold his temper well in hand toward men the incident at his first visit to clayton springs was his only display towards his wife he gave it full sway Never was her face and body free from the marks of his beatings, and his blows and insults had left her spiritless. Dorothy Tibbets was frail and flaxen-haired, always tired-looking. Still, after six years as the wife of Snake, she showed more than a hint of her former beauty, loveliness that had made her the belle of the home village in old York State before she came west to be the wife of Snake. With the unaccountable heart of a woman, she loved Snake, and endured his lashings of both tongue and fist. Owing to the idolatry of every man in Moreland County, none dare say a word against Snake in her presence. They were not so reticent among themselves. Jem Bates voiced the opinion of all. That damned Snake, he burst out one day, if he ever accidentally nips his thumb, when he takes a chaw of eatin tobacco all the booze in the state won't cure his poison he'll swell up and burst like a mosquito these neighbors had they ever learned the details of snake's demise would have been the first to sense the poetic justice of it when building his trap lined cabin in a secluded ravine up the mountainside snake built with time serpent cunning he labored alone no one had seen him at work no one knew that beneath the rough slab floor was a cellar some eight feet square and five feet deep it was reached by a trapdoor cleverly concealed beneath the bunk the only light came through a narrow crack between the cabin wall and the ground some day mused snake as he dug i'll get sore and kill that whimpering female then I'll need this hideout. He glanced at a six foot length of one inch rope coiled in the corner. It was a drizzly, damp spring night when Snake realized that his foresight would prove of immediate worth. His wife had been more than usually docile. She endured his curses without remonstrance. This inflamed Snake's twisted brain. With maniacal fury, he seized her about the throat and wrung her neck as a cook wrings the neck of a chicken he carelessly flung her body into a corner then as realization of what he had done dawned he made a pack of all the edibles in the house slinging it to his back he started for his retreat he did not know that the slamming door had overturned the lamp 
and fired the house. The wind howled dismally through the trees. Wet branches, like dead hands, slapped Snake in the face. At times the scraping of boughs brought him up standing, so much like the groan of a stricken woman they sounded. It was with a somewhat shaky set of nerves that Snake pushed open the cabin door. Into the cellar Snake dragged a few blankets. His pack of provisions and two canteens of water followed. It was pitch dark. Not daring to strike a light, he spread the blankets and laid down to dream troubled sleep. His neighbors were on the trail sooner than he had expected. Attracted by the light from the burning cabin, John Paxton was the first on the scene of the tragedy. He lived but half a mile down the valley, and arrived in time to read the marks. Soon a dozen well-armed men were on the trail. Knowing of Snake's mountain cabin, it was there that the hunt centered. A thorough search failed to reveal the well-concealed hiding place. On account of the intense darkness, it was useless to search further that night. The man-hunters bunked down in the cabin to snatch a few hours of sleep before dawn. It was their stirring that awakened Snake. Day was just breaking. For some moments he lay with his eyes closed, listening to the comments on the killing. "'Hangin's too good for that dirty devil,' growled Jem Bates. "'Burnin' is better. But I vote for a slow burnin', you bet.' "'I bet he's lit out across the divide,' hazarded Jack Williams, veteran trailer. "'We'll foller him clean to California. The law'll never get its hands on him.' Snake almost chuckled aloud as he slowly opened his eyes. Instantly he froze with horror. Not three feet in front of his face was a sinister and menacing coil. Quickly he closed his eyes for a few seconds. It was no dream. The coil was there. He could almost see the quiver of the sinuous body about to strike. It seemed he could feel the pair of jet-black, glistening eyes glaring into his own. He could imagine deadly fangs fastening into his cheek. If only he dared draw his gun and blow off the reptile's head. That would bring more enemies more deadly about him. If only the men above would leave before some inadvertent movement drew that attack. Then stark terror took him. Now the reptile breathed twin jets of fire. Now it grinned at him in hideous fashion. Again it grew, and grew, until it almost crowded him out of the cellar. It disappeared for a second. Then the blessed relief was broken by finding it more menacing than ever in the other corner. Through it all, Snake uttered no word. At length, with hypnotic power, the eyes drew him. He gently rolled onto his stomach. He began to wriggle toward the thing. Could he grasp at its slimy throat and choke it before it struck? That was his only chance. He would rather die from the poisonous fangs than lie here trembling and chilling with terror. He moved cautiously, stealthily, his fear-filled eyes dimmed and glowed alternately. Was the reptile moving toward him, or merely lying in wait, biding its time before it struck? He was close enough to grasp it. Slowly he raised his hand. He slipped. His face fell forward into the very center of the coil as his hand closed around the slimy throat. Then it was over. Many days were consumed in the search for the murderer. At length the disappointed men returned empty-handed. In time the story of the crime was almost forgotten. But, to this day, in the cellar beneath the rough slab floor, on a faraway mountain ravine, lies the moldering skeleton. Its long bony fingers clutch tightly around the end of a six-foot strand of slimy rope. The end of Snake
by Galen Collin. The Snake Fiend by Farnsworth Wright. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Snake Fiend by Farnsworth Wright. Even as a child, Jack Creamy delighted in collecting reptiles, and he seemed to absorb much of their venomous nature. His best loved pet was a large black snake, but when it caused him a whipping by crawling into his father's bedroom, he roasted it over a slow fire in a large pot, listening with glee to its agonized hissing and pushing it back with a stick when it strove to crawl out of the searing container. It was no cause for wonder, then, that his burning love for the girl of his dreams turned to fierce hate when she became the bride of another. Creamy's sentiment for Marjorie Bressy was aroused by her fine Italian beauty, which reminded him of his mother. He could have fallen in love with any other girl as easily, if he had set his mind to it in the same way. By dint of comparing her with his mother's picture, he conceived a great admiration for her. Then he wished to possess her, to be her lord and master, to marry her. Gazing on her every day with this thought in his mind, his admiration grew to a burning passion. Of all this he said nothing to Marjorie, and then it was too late. Marjorie loved and was loved by Alan Jimerson, a young civil engineer. Creamy neither threatened nor cajoled. He simply accepted the fact and meditated revenge. He was all smiles at their wedding, and he gave them a wedding present beyond what he could reasonably afford, while he planned to tumble their happiness in ruins about their ears. After a short honeymoon, Jimerson departed with his wife to take up his duties as resident engineer of some construction work on the Western Railroad. Creamy, his face glowing with friendship and goodwill, was the last to clasp Marjorie's hand in farewell as the train pulled out of the station. "'Write to me often, Marjorie,' was his parting injunction. "'Send me a letter as soon as you get settled, and let me know how you are getting along. I don't want to lose touch with either of you.' And he meant it. Marjorie was fond of the handsome, manly-looking Italian youth, and liked him immensely as a friend although she had never been in love with him. No sooner was she settled in her new home than she wrote him a long letter, telling of her husband's work, the bleakness of the desert country, and the strange newness of her life. She and her husband occupied a cabin together, apart from the bulk housing of the construction camp, in the sagebrush region of northern California, not far from the Nevada border. A fierce joy and exultation leapt in Creamy's heart when he read Marjorie's letter. "'You would like this country better than I do,' she wrote, "'for it is infested with rattlesnakes. The bare desert rocks on the ridge four miles from our cabin are swarming with them. Ugh! They sun themselves in tangled masses,' Alan says, "'but truly I can't bring myself to go near the place. I get quite too much of snakes without that, for we are constantly killing them in the sagebrush. This country has never been settled, and except for an occasional prospector, there was nobody to kill them before the surveyors came. The Indians never bothered the snakes, but pass by them on the other side of a sagebrush and leave them in peace. Creamy scored these lines in red ink, word by word, as if to blazon them on his memory, and he drew little pictures of snakes on the margin. He burned out Marjorie's signature with acid, spitefully watching with minute care as the letters faded, and gleaning a savage satisfaction from seeing the paper rot away under the venomous bite of the poison. Then he fed the paper to the flames, as he had roasted the black snake years before, and watched the missive burn into black ashes, 
and crumbles slowly away page by page into gray dust followed creamy's pursuit of the pair his arrival was not expected by either jimison or marjorie but it was none the less welcome for both of them liked the genial companionable italian life on the edge of the desert had few distractions at best creamy's eyes lit with genuine pleasure at the sight of his prospective victims the joy on both sides was sincere no this isn't a pleasure trip he explained to them although i expect to have pleasure enough out of it before i get through i have turned from collecting reptiles to studying their lives and habits i intend to write a monograph on rattlesnakes when i got your letter marjorie i knew that i could do no better than to come here i expect to become very well acquainted with that ridge you wrote about where the snakes sun themselves in tangled masses marjorie shuddered and creamy laughed well don't bring any of your snakes around here she said i turn cold and something grips at my insides every time i hear one rattle creamy built himself a small cabin about a mile from the jimmersons in the direction of the rattlesnake ridge he adorned the shack tastefully and marjorie's deft hand gave it a distinctively feminine neatness and charm to its appearance he became a frequent visitor at the jimmersons cabin and evening after evening he read to them in his melodious well modulated voice sometimes the draftsman or transitman would come in and creamy would join in playing cards until late at night he seemed to take pleasure in the company of marjorie and her husband and his face always lit up at the sight of them especially when they were together but it was the joy of a boy who sees the apples ripening for him on the neighbor's tree and knows that they will soon be ready for him to pluck he was almost happy when he was meditating his frightful revenge as his preparations drew near their end he often spent whole hours gloating over the fate in store for the couple for marjorie in loving jimerson had aroused him to insane jealousy and jimerson having robbed him of his heart's desire was included in creamy's fierce hate of the girl who had crossed him then one evening marjorie and her husband happened in at creamy's cabin marjorie expressed her horror at the thought of creamy wandering among the snake infested rocks of the rattlesnake ridge the snake hunter seated her on a box that contained a twisting knot of the venomous reptile marjorie serenely unaware talked on blithely and creamy's merry laugh pealed out at regular intervals he was in right jovial mood that evening for he was ready to spring the death trap prepared for his two friends he only awaited a favorable opportunity to strike the opportunity came when the surveyor's cook crazed by bad whiskey smashed up the kitchen jimerson discharged him and the cook muttered threats of a horrible vengeance shut up jimerson ordered this is the third time you've been seeing snakes and now you've wrecked the cook shack you ought to be sent to jail or a lunatic asylum it's you that'll be seeing snakes the cook spluttered you and that italian wife of yours will see plenty of them red and green and jimerson struck him across the mouth and sent him on his way this was in the evening the draftsman and the rodsman went to town the next day to hire a new cook while jimerson and marjorie went on an outing at the headwaters of the feather creek it was sunday and they intended to spend the day together cramini declined their invitation to accompany them it was the molting season he explained when the snakes were casting off their skins he could ill afford to lose a day of observation at this time for he had several perplexing points to clear up before writing his monograph cramini walked fearlessly from rock to rock of the rattlesnake ridge chuckling to himself the tangled mass of snakes of which he had been told existed only in rumor although there were snakes in plenty if one looked for them tangled masses would serve his purpose later 
but he had gathered them here and there one or two at a time by noon the little cluster of cabins occupied by the engineers was deserted marjorie and her husband had gone since sunup and the surveyors were all in town not a soul was stirring in the neighborhood of the shacks and the men at the construction camp were mostly lying around in their bunks or playing cards Cremaney nailed fast the windows of Jimerson's cabin. Then he entered and secured the bed to the floor so that it could not be moved. He laboriously carried his box of snakes a mile or more from his room to the little gully behind the surveyor's cabins and hid them in the sagebrush. Marjorie and her husband came back from their tramp after dark that evening, dog-tired. Marjorie cooked a little supper and by ten o'clock the two were asleep. Cremini entered their cabin about midnight. They were fast in the chains of slumber, and he did not find it necessary to muffle his tread. He removed the chairs, shoes, clothes, and even the hand mirror and toilet articles. Everything that might serve as a weapon, no matter how slight, he took away. Then he brought his snakes from the gully and collected them in front of the cabin. When he had assembled them all, he knocked the top from the largest box, carried it into the room, and in the audacity of his certain triumph, he dumped the twisted mass of rattlesnakes on the bed where Marjorie and her husband lay asleep. The other boxes he emptied quickly just inside the door, and withdrew, for he had no wish to set foot among the venomous serpents. Revenge is never satisfied if the retribution overtakes the avenger, and Cremini had no wish to share the fate of his victims. He locked the door from the outside and battened it. Then he removed the boxes that had contained the snakes and returned to his cabin and peacefully went to sleep. Marjorie awoke with the first rays of the sun and lazily opened her eyes. Her heart leapt suddenly into her throat and she was wide awake in an instant. A flat, squat head of a rattlesnake was creeping along her breast. Its beady eyes were fixed on her face, and its red tongue flicked before her like a forked flame. For a moment she thought she was still dreaming, but the familiar outlines of the room lined themselves in her consciousness, and she knew that what she saw was real. Her shriek rent the air as she threw back the bedclothes and sprang to the floor. She stepped on a coiled serpent, which sounded an ominous warning as it struck out blindly. She quickly climbed back on the bed and stood on the pillow, screaming. Her husband was beside her at once, hazily trying to understand the import of the hysterical torrent of words she was sobbing into his ears. For an instant he thought she must be in the clutch of some horrible nightmare. Then a quick, startled glance around the room turned his blood to ice there was now a continuous rattling as of dry leaves blowing against a stone wall for marjorie's screams had galvanized the snakes into activity the room was filled with their angry din it sounded in jimerson's ears like the crack of doom the floor seemed covered with the creeping reptiles some were coiled the whirring tips of their tails making an indistinct blur as they rattled, and their heads swaying slowly back and forth. Others writhed along the floor, their venomous squat heads thrusting forward and withdrawing, and their tongues darting out like red flames. On the bed itself there was a motion underneath the thrown-back coverlet, and the ugly gray head of a thick, four-foot snake protruded from under it the evil eyes shining dully, as if through a film of dust. It extricated itself and coiled as if to strike, while Marjorie shrank fearfully against the wall, wide-eyed with horror. Jimerson attacked the reptile with the pillow, sweeping it off the bed onto the floor. He quickly looked around him for a weapon and saw at once that he was trapped. There was not even a shoe or a pincushion with which to fight the crawling, rattling creatures. He tried to rock the bed toward the window, 
as boys move sawhorses forward while sitting on them but the bed was firmly fastened to the floor and in his efforts to release it he was bitten on the wrist by the strike of a large snake coiled near the foot of the bed jimerson flung the reptile across the room and sprang to the floor with an oath crushing a large rattler with his heel as he jumped he raced to the door and wrestled with it for a full minute before he discovered that he and marjorie were locked in that serpent hole he sprang to the window and felt a sharp stab of pain in the flesh of his calf as the open jaws of another reptile found their mark and the poison fangs were embedded deep in the flesh the window like the door was nailed fast but he broke out the glass with his bare fists unmindful of the blood on his lacerated hands he was back at the bedside treading over reptiles with his bare feet marjorie lay on the bed unconscious he lifted her in his bleeding arms and hurled her through the window to safety he struggled out after her tearing open his bitten leg on the jagged pieces of glass still left in the window frame the spurting blood drenched him and he leaned faint and dizzy against the cabin as three of his surveyors came running up having been attracted by marjorie's screams in almost incoherent words he told them what had happened he asked them to make immediate search for the discharged cook for there was no doubt in jimerson's mind that it was the cook who had placed the snakes in the room then the sky went suddenly black before his eyes and he lost consciousness at that minute cremini was waking from a peaceful dream he recalled what he had done the night before and blissfully mused on what must be taking place in the jimerson cabin a phantasmagorical succession of pictures weltered in his mind marjorie and her husband fighting with bare hands against the serpents bitten a score of times by the angry fangs of the rattlesnakes clinging to each other in terror sinking to the floor in agony as the poison swelled their tortured limbs and overcame them lying green and blue in death with rattlesnakes crawling and hissing over their dead bodies it is remarkable how few people die from rattlesnake bites even when as badly bitten as jimerson was probably not one adult victim in a hundred succumbs to the venom although mistaken popular belief considers rattlesnake poison as fatal as the death potion of the borgias jimerson had known too many cases of snake bite to believe his case hopeless he did not give up and die nor did he try to poison his system with whiskey he knew that this condition was serious but he let rest and permanganate of potash rubbed into his wounds affect a cure the bleeding from the lacerated leg had almost entirely washed out the poison and there was little swelling the pain in his swollen wrist however distended almost to bursting kept him from sleeping and the sickly green hue of the bite distressed him but it did not kill him creamy careful observer of reptiles though he was had never known an actual case of snake bite and he shared the popular illusion that the bite of the rattlesnake dooms its victims to death hence he was certain of the complete success of his revenge and his gloating glee was unclouded by even the shadow of a doubt that marjorie and her husband had been killed in his death trap he awaited only the supreme joy of drinking in the details of his success to feel the exultant thrill of complete victory as creamy sat alone two days after the horrible morning jimerson was limping slowly toward his cabin his swollen hand still pained him badly and there was a dull ache in his ankle when he put too much weight on it but he thought the fresh air would benefit him supporting himself with a cane and leaning heavily on marjorie at times he went painfully toward the young italian's deserted home not once had his suspicions pointed toward creamy as the author of the crime for the guilt of the lunatic cook seemed all too clear 
Besides, he liked Creamy for his genial camaraderie, his joviality and good humor, and his frank interest in everything that concerned either him or Marjorie. So intent was the snake fiend on passing the torments of his victims before his fancy that he did not hear the knock on his cabin door. His brain was too busy to heed the message sent by his ears, for he was feasting on the mental and physical tortures that Jimerson and Marjorie must have endured before they lay cold in death on the floor of the cabin, hideously discolored by the venom of the rattlesnakes. By degrees he became conscious that he was not alone. Two persons stood before him, and he raised a vengeful spirit on the story he had been waiting two days to hear. Even when he gazed at those whom he had consigned to a horrible death, the thought that they were alive did not permeate his consciousness. The idea of failure had never entered his mind for even an instant. They were dead, beyond the peradventure of a doubt, and now their avenging ghosts stood before him. Crimmy dropped to his knees in white terror and crawled behind his chair. He clasped and unclasped his hands in agony of fear. Sweat poured from his face and bathed his body. He implored mercy. He screamed for forgiveness. He gibbered like a frightened ape. Half-forgotten words in Italian learned from his mother's knee fell from his lips. He pleaded and begged for his life, crawling on his face toward the amazed couple in an endeavor to clasp their knees. As the meaning of his broken ejaculations was borne in on them, a tremendous loathing and disgust overcame them. Marjorie clung to her husband, unnerved at the repulsive sight of the malicious coward groveling on the floor and trying to kiss their feet. Cremini shrieked and gnawed his hands as he saw the avenging angels of his victims leave the cabin. It was impossible for the stern hand of the law to inflict greater punishment on Jack Cremini than his own malice had wrought for him. Today he occupies a padded cell in a hospital for the incurably insane. The End of The Snake Fiend by Farnsworth Wright Thornton Smiled Significantly by David Morrison This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman Thornton Smiled Significantly by David Morrison one there is a lady outside who wishes to see you there is a man with her what's the name thornton asked visibly annoyed at the untimely intrusion she would give no name she said you would not know her she seems very anxious to see you thornton reflected a few moments it was rather early for callers and he had been about to dictate his morning mail he resented the visit, but, for some reason he could not fathom, he felt a slight curiosity as to the identity of his callers. He turned suddenly to his secretary. "'Show them in, Miss Armstrong, please.' As the pair entered, Thornton's curiosity was increased. The woman was about thirty years of age and strikingly attractive. She was expensively gowned and bore all the earmarks of wealth but her companion was rather shabbily dressed and impressed one as a servant of the woman the woman entered first the man followed behind her slowly almost timidly thornton noticed that he clutched in his hand a large square box-like affair covered in black cloth mr thornton the woman gushed advancing with a friendliness that was almost brazen thornton arose wonderingly I'm afraid you have the advantage of me. I am Miss Bender, Miss Ruth Bender, the caller beamed. I'm sorry if I've chosen a busy moment to intrude, but I'm sure you will pardon me 
when the nature of my visit is made known thornton motioned his visitor to a seat and as she drew up a chair looked up questioningly at her companion she seemed to have forgotten the man and now she turned toward him in sudden remembrance just take a chair mr parker she said making no move to introduce her companion who was standing a few feet away gazing stupidly about the room and shifting from one foot to another he made no effort to put down the cloth covered object he was holding at the sound of the woman's voice the man turned dully found a chair and sat down making no move to draw the chair closer evidently not considering himself a party to the conference he held the black box on his lap and seemed to handle it with extraordinary care the woman turned to thornton i suppose you're wondering at the reason for my call she began thornton smiled non-committally it's something of the greatest importance the stranger continued so i chose a time when i thought we would be least likely to be interrupted it's of a very confidential nature we will not be disturbed thornton found himself wondering just what it was about this woman that he did not like but she had now aroused his curiosity and he determined to give her an audience he rang for his secretary will you see that i am not disturbed for the next ten minutes he said to miss armstrong when she entered the girl nodded assent and withdrew when the door was closed the woman turned to thornton rather mysteriously mr thornton as a live wire businessman i believe you're interested in any legitimate proposition promising unusually large financial rewards she began thornton breathed a sigh of relief tinged with disappointment the woman's manner and method of approach had whetted his curiosity and expectations but he now prepared to listen to the usual harangues of the expert stock salesman i'll warn you beforehand he interrupted i am not interested in stocks of any nature the woman smiled knowingly i haven't come to sell you any stock mr thornton the proposition i have in mind is something larger better surer the rewards are well tremendous she leaned forward suddenly with an air of utmost confidence her voice was almost a whisper and she glanced occasionally at the man who had accompanied her and who was busy fixing the mysterious box in a comfortable position on his lap mr thornton the woman said in a low voice that man there has a device that is destined to earn tremendous rewards for its owners thornton glanced at the box on the man's lap with renewed interest what is it he asked that i cannot divulge at this time if you are interested i will have him explain in detail it is his own invention and naturally he is very jealous of his secrets he will let no one into the secret unless there is a probability of their being interested like all inventors she went on he is in need of financial assistance if he should show his device to you now you would grasp the secret immediately our proposition is this it will require a considerable amount of capital to float this thing properly but when you once learn the secret you will readily agree that it is the surest investment a man could possibly make the question is not whether it is a sure or risky investment there is no doubt of its feasibility but a question solely of finances it will take up considerable money and we do not wish to take up your time or our own unless you are readily able to handle a proposition of this size that would of course depend entirely upon my own opinion of its merit thornton replied mystified and curious to learn the nature of the device certainly mr thornton the woman returned we could hardly expect anyone to interest themselves in something they have no confidence in but it is not a question of confidence the moment you learn the secret you'll agree with us that the potential rewards in it are tremendous now granting that you are interested 
would you be able to finance a proposition requiring a considerable sum of money could you lay your hands on say fifty thousand dollars cash at any moment double that amount if the proposition is worth it thornton replied now really anxious to learn more about the mysterious box on the stranger's lap good the woman answered enthusiastically she turned to the man who had accompanied her mr parker will you demonstrate your device to mr thornton the man arose and stood by his chair as he fumbled with several small contrivances on the mysterious box he made no effort to advance closer to thornton's desk the woman leaned closer to thornton confidentially and whispered to him he's suspicious of everyone he won't show you the complete details now but you'll learn enough when you see it in operation it will surprise you i assure you the man was facing directly toward thornton as he fumbled in his pocket for an object which he lay on top of the box a false lid was raised and thornton could not see what the object was that the man placed on the box for the upraised lid hid it from view the man seemed to have trouble in working some of the mysterious parts for he finally laid the box on the chair by his side to give him entire freedom of both hands he bent down over the box for a few seconds while he worked with something behind the upraised lid suddenly the woman at thornton's side uttered a half smothered shriek and clasped her hands to her heart thornton turned quickly in alarm the woman's eyes were widely dilated for a moment as if in extreme agony then she suddenly slumped over in a faint she would have fallen but thornton quickly reached out his arm and caught her he supported her in his arm while he looked up at the man get some water quick this woman has fainted the man seemed to grasp the situation instantly for he immediately turned and hurried toward the door leading to the outer office as he did so there was a sudden blinding flash of light from the mysterious box on the chair the events in the next few moments happened with dramatic rapidity the man turned suddenly at the flash of light grabbed the mysterious box and hurried out of the office the unconscious woman in thornton's arms suddenly revised fixed her slightly disarrayed hat and gown and arose to take her departure she smiled amusedly at the thoroughly mystified and dumbstruck thornton i thank you so much for the audience mr thornton she smiled but i do not want to take up any more of your time than is absolutely necessary we'll return at this time tomorrow with the photograph photograph thornton repeated the light of comprehension entering his eyes yes provided of course that it proves to be a good one if it should not turn out to be clear enough we won't bother you again then that mysterious invention was a uh, camera the woman smiled mockingly it seldom fails we've taken some wonderfully good photographs with it convinced now that the woman's motives were ulterior thornton confronted her with the feeling of resentment at having been tricked so easily i'm a busy man miss bender give me your proposition in as few words as possible he said curtly she seemed gallingly oblivious to his scorn we expect to have a very good photograph of you mr thornton with me in your arms it's merely a question of who considers that photograph of greater value you or mrs thornton we consider it worth to you at least five thousand dollars that shouldn't be a staggering sum to a man who can lay his hand on fifty thousand cash at any moment he desires and suppose i don't consider it worth or rather suppose i refuse to pay the blackmail then of course i shall make the best bargain possible with mrs thornton i'm giving you the first option so generous of you thornton smiled scornfully she seemed entirely unabashed and stood waiting expectantly 
as if never doubting the final acceptance of her offer thornton was interested in the woman's method she seemed so confident in herself tell me he said interestedly is this an everyday occurrence with you she smiled reprovingly rich men are not so plentiful mr thornton besides we must pick our time i never take chances i always make sure of my ground first you will notice that i chose a time when you would be least likely to have any callers but why all the rigmarole about the mysterious invention he persisted i can't seem to conquer my love of dramatics mr thornton the woman replied smiling sheepishly i once followed the profession you know until i discovered there were greater returns in my present one besides it is rather difficult to prepare to take a flashlight in a man's office without exciting his suspicion the curtain covering the lens of the camera you will recall was not drawn back until the exact moment before the charge of powder was ignited all a matter of mechanism she explained rather proudly i suppose the returns are very gratifying he queried noticing a huge diamond on her finger i have no complaint she replied not taken aback in the slightest sometimes it is rather embarrassing but i try to cause as little trouble as possible and is that part of your returns thornton asked pointing to the stone on her finger which was flashing brilliantly in the early morning sunlight she gazed proudly at the diamond isn't it gorgeous she said enthusiastically thornton knew enough of precious stones to realize that the ring must have cost several thousand dollars the diamond was extraordinarily large and very fine cut the woman turned suddenly to go well mr thornton i know you're a busy man so i won't take up any more of your time today if we have been unfortunate in our photography we will not bother you again if it comes up to our expectations i shall return tomorrow at this time for your decision thornton bowed her out admiring in spite of himself the woman's self-possession and complete confidence a few moments later he rang for his secretary anxious to get his day's mail off his mind so that he could give thought to the new problem that had thrust itself upon him he waited a few moments and was surprised that miss armstrong was not as prompt as usual in answering he looked into the outer office and found her at her desk gazing dreamily out the window apparently oblivious to her surroundings he called her wonderingly she rose with a start and smiling sheepishly followed him into his office daydreaming he asked smiling miss armstrong laughed rather shamefacedly yes and a very foolish thing to dream about i was picturing myself wearing the ring worn by the lady who just left it was beautiful wasn't it he conceded oh it was wonderful the secretary exclaimed with beaming eyes from the expression on the girl's face thornton could understand how some women sold their souls for less expensive baubles. 2. Promptly at 10.30 the next morning, Miss Bender called and was ushered immediately into Thornton's private office. Thornton nodded a pleasant greeting and offered her a chair. He noticed a large envelope in her hand and surmised that it contained the photograph. He glanced up at her expectantly i have good news mr thornton miss bender smiled that is good news if you look at it from my viewpoint you succeeded in getting a good photograph excellent it could not be clearer he found himself wondering why he was able to joke so pleasantly with this woman who had so easily tricked him and then laughed at his stupidity now would you mind giving me your proposition in detail miss there is nothing that i did not tell you yesterday mr thornton she interrupted i have the photograph here which my assistant took yesterday it is a first-class likeness of yourself holding me in your arms 
I believe it should be worth at least five thousand dollars to you. If you don't agree with me, then I shall strike a bargain with Mrs. Thornton for it. I'm sure it would interest her. And if I pay you this five thousand dollars, what is to prevent you from— I'll give you the negative also, and my word of honor, that I shall make no further attempt to use the incidents against you. Thornton smiled at the reference to her word of honor. You realize, I suppose, he said slowly and with emphasis, that this is pure blackmail. Please don't use that word, Mr. Thornton, the woman returned mockingly. There are so many nicer ways of expressing it. Would you mind allowing me to see what I am asked to pay such a sum of money for? Thornton said, changing the subject abruptly. His visitor obligingly produced the photograph and handed it over. From the attitude of the two in the picture, it would certainly be conclusive evidence in any divorce court. Thornton gazed at it a few moments, smiled enigmatically, then turned to his desk and picked up a large envelope. Placing the photograph inside, he silently addressed the envelope and sealed it. His visitor sensed a trick. Just a reminder, Mr. Thornton, that you haven't paid for the photograph yet, and another reminder that I still have the negative and can make as many duplicates as I choose. Thornton made no reply, but turned and faced the door leading to his outer office. Have you everything so far, Miss Armstrong? he asked without raising his voice. The woman turned quickly on her guard, but she saw no one. The man at the desk was evidently talking to the wall. She glanced hurriedly about the office, then turned and stared wonderingly at Thornton. Three short, sharp knocks sounded on the outer door. Thornton smiled. You may cut the wires now, Miss Armstrong, please, he said pleasantly. Two short knocks sounded on the door in answer to his instructions. Thornton turned to his caller. Now, Miss Bender, is it? I want to thank you for the photograph and compliment you on the excellence of the work. The woman's lips curled in contempt, and she laughed carelessly, evidently confident of herself. I must warn you again, Mr. Thornton, that I still have the negative. It's a matter of a few minutes to make a duplicate of that photograph. Thornton ignored her remark as he continued. I will admit that I consider the photograph easily worth the amount you ask. But as long as it is not necessary to purchase it, why should I? The woman arose furious and prepared to make her departure. Just a moment, please, Thornton said quietly. I'll have to ask my secretary to unlock the door before you can go. The woman rushed angrily to the door, for she believed Thornton was bluffing. She tried the knob and found the door locked. She turned to the man at the desk with challenging eyes. Well, what's the game? she panted, her first doubt beginning to assail her sense of security. Won't you sit down a few moments? Thornton said, smiling at her discomfiture. Miss Bender obeyed, then turned as if waiting for his next move. I think you told me your profession was a very well-paid one, he began. His visitor glanced at him venomously and made no reply. Assuming that your words are true, I should think your liberty would be worth something to you. Miss Bender turned her face ugly in its mask of baffled rage. You can turn me over to the police, but a copy of the photograph will be in Mrs. Thornton's hands tomorrow, she said furiously. My assistant will attend to that, and what I will swear to on the witness stand will be plenty. Thornton smiled at her anger. Somehow he felt a curious sense of pleasure in playing with her, as a cat does before eating the mouse it has caught. My secretary has taken down every word that has passed between us this morning, he resumed. He arose and pulled aside a large picture hanging on the wall. The woman turned and saw a dictaphone and knew the man was not bluffing. You realize, I suppose, that it is within my power to... 
Well, what's your proposition? the blackmailer demanded impatiently. Thornton reached over and pointed to the ring on her finger. If you consider a half hour's work worth five thousand dollars, wouldn't you consider your liberty worth that ring? The woman seemed dumbstruck at his words. Why, it's preposterous, she exclaimed, seething with fury. That's according to the viewpoint you adopt, Thornton replied, quietly, with a note of triumphant mockery in his voice. I'm busy, Miss Bender, but I'll grant you ten minutes to make your decision. Hand over that ring on your finger, and I'll give you your freedom, and make no attempt at prosecution for your attempted blackmail. Otherwise, I shall be compelled to telephone for the police. After a few minutes' deliberation, the woman suddenly tore the ring from her finger and threw it angrily on his desk. An almost imperceptible sob escaped her lips. Thornton picked up the ring and placed it in his pocket. Before you go, Miss Bender, I want to add to your disappointment by telling you that Mrs. Thornton would gladly have given you five thousand dollars for that photograph. That dictaphone you saw behind the picture was placed there by detectives in the employ of Mrs. Thornton. She suspected that I was in love with my secretary. I pretended ignorance and allowed the instrument to remain, though I knew of its presence from the beginning. It was an easy matter to run in another wire for my stenographer yesterday, in readiness for your return. He pressed the button on the desk, and Miss Armstrong unlocked the door and entered. He handed her the envelope containing the photograph. Will you please mail that for me at once, Miss Armstrong? And register it, please. The girl took the package and left the office. The woman took advantage of her opportunity and gained the safety of the outer office. She turned and glared evilly at Thornton. Well, Mr. Thornton, for your trickery, I'll reward you by telling you that Mrs. Thornton will receive a copy of that photograph in tomorrow morning's mail. Which won't particularly interest her, Thornton replied, smiling, as she will receive the original in this afternoon's mail. My secretary has just mailed it to her by registered mail. You mailed that to your wife? the woman gasped incredulously. Certainly. You see, Miss Bender, a divorce is the best thing that could possibly be handed to both Mrs. Thornton and myself. Our marriage is one that was never destined to last. It has survived this long only because of lack of sufficient grounds for divorce. And I would not think of bringing any unpleasant notoriety to any lady until you obligingly handed me what both Mrs. Thornton and myself have been seeking for months. Good day, and thank you so much. The woman stormed out of the office, furious at the circumstances that had robbed her of the large sum she had expected, and nettled by the taunting mockery in her intended victim's voice. A few minutes later Miss Armstrong returned. She handed her employer the postal receipt for the registered package. Got it off all right, he smiled. Yes, it will probably be delivered this afternoon. Good, he smiled rather anxiously. He turned suddenly to the girl. Valance, what was it you were daydreaming over yesterday when you couldn't hear my ring for dictation? The girl gazed at him in smiling uncertainty for a moment, the incident not coming to her instantly. Oh, about the ring that woman was wearing, she replied, laughing sheepishly. Well, it was one daydream that came true, Thornton said, reaching in his vest pocket. He withdrew his hand and placed the ring on her finger. The girl's eyes widened in astonishment as she stared at the sparkling stone in disbelief. Why, it's just like the one that woman wore, she breathed in rapt admiration. The stone is fully as large. Yes, it does resemble it somewhat, doesn't it? Thornton smiled significantly. The end of Thornton Smiled Significantly by David Morrison
The Torture by Hope by Villiers de Lee Adam This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andy Sames Many years ago, as evening was closing in, the venerable Pedro Abuez de Espila, sixth prior of the Dominicans of Segovia, and third Grand Inquisitor of Spain, followed by a Fra Redemptor, and preceded by two familiars of the Holy Office, the latter, carrying lanterns, made their way to a subterranean dungeon. The bolt of a massive door creaked, and they entered a mephitic impace, where the dim light revealed between rings fastened to a wall a blood-stained rack, a brazier, and a jug. On a pile of straw loaded with fetters, and his neck encircled by an iron carcan, sat a haggard man of uncertain age, clothed in rags. This prisoner was no other than Rabbi Asa Abarbanel, a Jew of Aragon, who, accused of usury and pitiless scorn for the poor, had been daily subjected to torture for more than a year. Yet his blindness was as dense as his hide, and he had refused to abjure his faith. Proud of a filiation dating back thousands of years, proud of his ancestors, for all Jews worthy of the name are vain of their blood, he descended Talmudically from Othoniel, and consequently from Ipsiboa, the wife of the last judge of Israel, a circumstance which had sustained his courage amid incessant torture. With tears in his eyes at the thought of this resolute soul rejecting salvation, the venerable Pedro Abuez de Espila, approaching the shuddering rabbi, addressed him as follows. My son, rejoice, your trials here below are about to end. If in the presence of such obstinacy I was forced to permit, with deep regret, the use of great severity, my task of fraternal correction has its limits. You are the fig tree which, having failed so many times to bear fruit, at last withered. But God alone can judge your soul. Perhaps infinite mercy will shine upon you at the last moment. We must hope so. There are examples. So sleep in peace tonight. Tomorrow you will be included in the auto da fe, that is, you will be exposed to the Quamadero, the symbolical flames of the everlasting fire. It burns, as you know, only at a distance, my son. And death is at least two hours, often three, in coming, on account of the wet iced bandages with which we protect the heads and hearts of the condemned. There will be forty-three of you, placed in the last row, you will have time to invoke God and offer to Him this baptism of fire, which is of the Holy Spirit. Hope in the light and rest. With these words having signed to his companions to unchain the prisoner, the prior tenderly embraced him. Then came the turn of the Fra Redemptor, who, in a low tone, entreated the Jew's forgiveness for what he had made him suffer for the purpose of redeeming him. Then the two familiars silently kissed him. This ceremony over, the captive was left solitary and bewitched in the darkness. Rabbi Asa Arbabinel, with parched lips and visage worn by suffering, at first gazed at the closed door with vacant eyes. Closed? The word unconsciously roused a vague fancy in his mind, the fancy that he had seen for an instant, the light of the lanterns through a chink between the door and the wall. A morbid idea of hope, due to the weakness of his brain, stirred his whole being. He dragged himself toward the strange appearance, then very gently and cautiously, slipping one finger into the crevice, he drew the door toward him. Marvellous! By an extraordinary accident, the familiar who closed it had turned the huge key an instant before it struck the stone casing, so that the rusty bolt, not having entered the hole, 
The door again rolled on its hinges. The rabbi ventured to glance outside. By the aid of a sort of luminous dusk he distinguished at first a semicircle of walls indented by winding stairs and opposite to him. At the top of five or six stone steps a sort of black portal opening into an immense corridor whose first arches only were visible from below. Stretching himself flat, he crept to the threshold. Yes, it was really a corridor, but endless in length. A wan light illuminated it. Lamps suspended from the vaulted ceiling lightened at intervals the dull hue of the atmosphere. The distance was veiled in shadow. Not a single door appeared in the whole extent. Only on one side, the left, heavily grated loopholes sunk in the walls, admitted a light which must be that of evening, for crimson bars at intervals rested on the flags of the pavement. What a terrible silence! Yet yonder at the far end of that passage there might be a doorway of escape. The Jew's vacillating hope was tenacious, for it was the last. Without hesitating, he ventured on the flags, keeping close under the loopholes, trying to make himself part of the blackness of the long walls. He advanced slowly, dragging himself along on his breast, forcing back the cry of pain when some raw wound sent a keen pang through his whole body. Suddenly the sound of a sandaled foot approaching reached his ears. He trembled violently. Fear stifled him. His sight grew dim. Well, it was over, no doubt. He pressed himself into a niche, and half lifeless with terror, waited. It was a familiar, hurrying along. He passed swiftly by, holding in his clenched hand an instrument of torture, a frightful figure, and vanished. The suspense which the rabbi had endured seemed to have suspended the functions of life, and he lay nearly an hour unable to move. Fearing an increase of tortures if he were captured, he thought of returning to his dungeon, but the old hope whispered in his soul, that divine, perhaps, which comforts us in our sorest trials. A miracle had happened. He could doubt no longer. He began to crawl toward the chance of escape. Exhausted by suffering and hunger, trembling with pain, he pressed onward. The sepulchral corridor seemed to lengthen mysteriously, while he, still advancing, gazed into the gloom where there must be some avenue of escape. Oh! Oh! He heard again footsteps, but this time they were slower, more heavy. The white and black forms of two inquisitors appeared. Emerging from the obscurity beyond, they were conversing in low tones and seemed to be discussing some important subject, for they were gesticulating vehemently. At this spectre, Rabbi Asa Ababanel closed his eyes. His heart beat so violently that it almost suffocated him. His rags were damp with the cold sweat of agony. He lay motionless by the wall, his mouth wide open, under the rays of a lamp, praying to the God of David. Just opposite to him, the two inquisitors paused under the light of the lamp, doubtless owing to some accident due to the course of their argument. One, while listening to his companion, gazed at the rabbi, and, beneath the look, whose absence of expression the hapless man did not at first notice. He fancied he again felt the burning pincers scorch his flesh. He was once more a living wound. Fainting, breathless, with fluttering eyelids, he shivered at the touch of the monk's floating robe. But, strange yet natural fact, the inquisitor's gaze was evidently that of a man deeply absorbed in his intended reply, engrossed by what he was hearing. His eyes were fixed and seemed to look at the Jew without seeing him. In fact, after the lapse of a few minutes, the two gloomy figures slowly pursued their way, still conversing in low tones toward the place 
whence the prisoner had come. He had not been seen. Amid the horrible confusion of the rabbi's thought, the idea darted through his brain. Can I be already dead that they did not see me? A hideous impression roused him from his lethargy. In looking at the wall against which his face was pressed, he imagined he beheld two fierce eyes watching him. He flung his head back in a sudden frenzy of fright, his hair fairly bristling. Yet, no, his hand groped over the stones. It was the reflection of the Inquisitor's eyes, still retained in his own, which had been refracted from two spots on the wall. Forward. He must hasten toward that goal which he fancied, absurdly no doubt, to be deliverance, toward the darkness from which he was now barely thirty paces distant. He pressed forward faster on his knees, his hands at full length, dragging himself painfully along, and soon entered the dark portion of this terrible corridor. Suddenly the poor wretch felt a gust of cold air on the hands resting upon the flags. It came from under the little door to which the two walls led. Oh, heaven, if that door should open outward! Every nerve in the miserable fugitive's body thrilled with hope. He examined it from top to bottom, though scarcely able to distinguish its outlines in the surrounding darkness. He passed his hand over it. No bolt, no lock, a latch. He started up. The latch yielded to the pressure of his thumb. The door silently swung open before him. Hallelujah, murmured the rabbi in a transport of gratitude, as standing on the threshold he beheld the scene before him. The door had opened into the gardens, above which arched a starlit sky into spring, liberty, life. It revealed the neighbouring fields stretching towards the Sierras, whose sinuous blue lines were relieved against the horizon. Yonder lay freedom. Oh, to escape! He would journey all night through the lemon groves whose fragrance reached him. Once in the mountains, and he was safe. He inhaled the delicious air. The breeze revived him. His lungs expanded. He felt in his swelling heart the veni foras of Lazarus, and to thank once more the God who had bestowed this mercy upon him. He extended his arms, raising his eyes toward heaven. It was an ecstasy of joy. Then, he fancied he saw the shadow of his arms approach him, fancied that he felt these shadowy arms enclose, embrace him, and that he was pressed tenderly to someone's breast. A tall figure actually did stand directly before him. He lowered his eyes and remained motionless, gasping for breath, dazed with fixed eyes, fairly driveling with terror. Horror! He was in the clasp of the Grand Inquisitor himself, the venerable Pedro Abuez de Spilla, who gazed at him with tearful eyes, like a good shepherd who has found his stray lamb. The dark-robed priest pressed the hapless Jew to his heart with so fervent an outburst of love that the edges of the monocle haircloth rubbed the Dominican's breast. And while Asa Ababanel, with protruding eyes, gasped in agony in the ascetic's embrace, vaguely comprehending that all the phases of this fatal evening were only a prearranged torture, that of hope. The Grand Inquisitor, with an accent of touching reproach and a look of consternation, murmured in his ear, his breath parched and burning from long fasting. What, my son, on the eve, perchance, of salvation, you wish to leave us? End of The Torture by Hope by Villiers de Lee Adam Recording by Andy Sames